to order the um, the city council ordinance meeting this evening in accordance with, um, and welcome everybody back, happy new year. In accordance with um, Charles D. Baker, March 10th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general ledger 30A section 20. The city, the Quincy city council had a public, for the public hearing on Monday, December 14th, actually not a public hearing, it's the 14th at 630. Um, this, um, I have the wrong thing, I apologize. I'm not gonna keep reading because it's the same, it's the same thing. Um, on January 11th, we're having this tonight. Um, we had the public hearing on December 14th. Um, on government access public hearing, um, I am reading, I apologize. Obviously I'm very rusty, so I apologize. I'm reading the absolute wrong thing. I'm not sure where my notes went. Let's get the rest start again, everybody. Welcome back. This is obviously I'm rusty. In accordance with Charles D. Baker, March 10th, 2020 order suspending the provisions of open open meeting laws, General Ledger 30A, Section 20, the Quincy City, City Council will be holding an ordinance meeting tonight, December 11th um, to um, at 630. It will air on Quincy Access TV channel, QA TV, government access with public works. Oh, I'm still messing this. Um, I can't believe I'm doing this. I'm very embarrassed and apologizing. Have this all set. Jen, could you send that to me via email because I don't have the correct the correct piece? Sure, I can just read it in. In accordance with Charles D. Baker's March 10th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30A, section 20, the Quincy City Council will be convening via remote services that will air on Quincy Access Television, television QA TV, channel QA TV 9, government access. It's a public hearing. Um, Ordinance committee meeting tonight on short term residential rentals. Thank you, Jen. This is obviously I've been very rusty, but we've been gone for quite some time. So I apologize to everybody who's out there who's watching. Jen, if you could call a roll order, that would be a roll, roll call, that would be great. Councilor Kane. Present. Councilor Kroll. Present. Councilor DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Councilor Liang. Present. Councilor McCarthy. Present. Councilor Palmucci. Present. Councilor Phelan. Present. Chairman Mahoney. Present. We have nine members, you have a quorum. Pursuant to that open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees, attendees there are there, therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. All right. Now, welcome back. So tonight is gonna to be our second meeting on the um, on the regulations for short-term residential rentals. And we have um, um, Steve Durkin with us tonight to, to review. What I'd like to say at the start of this is we've had the public hearing on this. And what I would like to try to do tonight, if it's possible, is to, to work through each ordinance, starting with 2020-125, and work through each section to see if there, I know that some of our counselors have put in some um, recommendations for changes, but I'd like to kind of work through them in order to, um, and then and then open it up for discussion. I know that Councillor Pellucci um, had some concerns about, um, in the last meeting that he had some concerns and he wanted to know where the current registry in the state are for um, Airbnbs in the city of Quincy and we'll review that as well. Um, but if we, maybe we could start with that just to review that request and if there are any other requests and then we can get into the particulars of going through the um, ordinance in the order that um, that it's perceived through 2020-125. So I'm gonna turn this over to Mr. Durkin for now. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, so the council has uh, once again before it, um, ordinance number 2020-125 and that's the, um, that's the underlying ordinance that regulates um, or purports to regulate short-term rentals and sets up a registration process, a registry of short-term rental units within the city of Quincy. And when I was last before the council, I was looking to get a flavor from councilors as to what um, councilors hope to achieve with, with this uh, regulatory ordinance. And um, Councilors did have several suggestions, and as Councilor Mahoney just mentioned, uh, Councilor Palmucci was 
concerned with uh, the question of how many units were we actually talking about in Quincy? You know, how many uh, properties were subject to uh, short-term rentals? And he, he was actually able to provide some information uh, from, from the state, um, which, he, which he sent to me which I think, um, Councilor Palmucci, correct me if I'm wrong, but it showed some 130 units uh, throughout the city of Quincy and various neighborhoods um, where it, it listed a street, but not a street number. So we didn't know the exact address. Um, I, actually I can actually tried add to, to just... that, Steve. Um, so, I can sit, if I may, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Absolutely. Um, since I sent you that, I was able to dig up some more um, information. So <clears throat> there, I'll just run through the numbers and then turn it back over to you, Steve, for the, um, your piece here. Uh, there are 211 total active short-term rental listings in Quincy. 93% are listed on Airbnb, 3% are listed on HomeAway, and 4% are listed on other um, services. There are, out of those 211, there are 130 properties that are registered with the state as required under Massachusetts law. Um, by my count, and it's a rough count because uh, the, the 130 that are registered um, with the state of Massachusetts um, for a lay person, which is how I was looking at this, not as a city official, uh, they only provide the street names and not the street numbers. Um, so I just kind of gave it a quick, a quick glance on street names that are Ward 4 streets in it. There were 38 of these listings were in um, Ward 4 or, or approximate to, to Ward 4 that are registered, which is about 29%. Um, the average occupancy of these uh, 211 active li listings is 59% per month. The average nightly rate, $148. The average monthly revenue per listing uh, is just under $2,000 at 1944 and there's been about a 10% drop between 2007, uh, 2017 and 2020 in the number of these listings. And then lastly, as far as what the listings are, 62% of those 211 active listings are entire homes that are listed for short-term rental. 37 are private, 37% uh, are private rooms, and then 1% are shared rooms. So that's just a little bit more about what these properties are that are listing, where they're exactly located. You can actually um, you can actually see a map of it, but they're spread out pretty thoroughly across the city. Although I think Ward Four has the bulk of them, with almost thirty percent of them located in Ward Four. So thank you. Thank you, Council Palmucci. So uh, yeah, thank you for that, Council Palmucci. And um, you would probably be more accurate than I on the number in your ward and. You, I think you said the number was 38 and um, I had come up with 33 and I wasn't sure about where some of them were just, just from memory where generally where streets are and what wards. And I came up with at least 25 from ward five, just uh, FYI to council of Phelan. And um, they were 15. I counted in ward six and there were probably more. Uh, it looks like about a dozen or more in ward two, ward three had, at least two and probably several more. And it looked like Wood One had at least seven and probably several more. So that's just uh, an FYI to all the councilors, but the, the ward councilors in particular. And once again, thank you for, um, thank you to Councilor Palmucci for following this up. Um, so we talked about the ordinance and I gave you the framework for uh, a short-term rental um, regulatory ordinance and councilors did give some input and uh, at the last meeting and some of the input ranged from concerns about absentee landlords and um, parking concerns in other words would uh, would would an Airbnb subject the neighborhood to all sorts of cars pulling into the neighborhood and parking on the street so that was a concern um, Councilor Kroll talked about uh, the issue of the local councilor being notified as to, you know, where these Airbnbs were, where these short-term rentals were, and and when um, 
a prospective owner was going to submit a registration to have a short-term rental, he wanted to see counselors be yeah. notified. Um, and he also wanted to see a butters within 300 feet of the, of the unit be notified. Um, and he wanted inspectional services to send an email to notify ward counselors. Um, several counselors emphasized that they don't want to see short-term rentals in residence A neighborhood. And we know residence A neighborhoods um, consist of single family homes. Um, Councilor Harris wanted to make sure that there were some teeth in the ordinance. In other words, make it a tough ordinance, make it strict uh, with strict regulations, strict standards. And he, uh, he also talked about bringing the health department into it. Um, and he expressed concerns as well about neighbors being made aware of of a, a prospective short-term rental in the neighborhood. Um, Council of Phelan expressed a preference for owner-occupied short-term rental units only, so that um, a short-term rental unit would have to have an owner that had that dwelling as his primary residence. Council of Mahoney, I think, uh, summarized uh, at the end of the meeting, she talked about parking concerns and the fact that counselors uh, expressed some concern that that they be owner occupied, um, and and uh, Councilor Mahoney also brought up the issue of exactly what are we dealing with throughout the city? How many how many short term rental units are we talking about? So, I have submitted to counselors. Um, I emailed some suggested. These are just proposed amendments, um, and I sent to, I sent those to counselors with. With, uh, with an email and there was an attachment. And uh, the attachment just consists of nine relatively minor amendments, but in, in drafting these amendments, I sought to uh, reflect some of the counselors' concerns that they had expressed at the last meeting and since. And so uh, I'll just go through them. Um, just quickly, I'll summarize them. Amendment number one is an amendment to section 196, subsection 14.4, which talks about ineligible residential units. In other words, those kinds of units in the city that wouldn't be eligible um, to, to be short-term rentals. And I added the following sentence, it's just one sentence. A residential unit, which is not the operator's primary residence or a residential unit which is not located in a dwelling that includes the operator's primary residence. That, a, a description like that would exclude that kind of a unit from being eligible to be offered as a short-term rental. So that would, that would exclude what's called professionally managed properties, which is say for example, um, someone owns three condominium units in a condominium complex they don't live in any of them, but they rent them all out as short-term rentals. So um, in, a, in, an, in an effort to address counselors' concerns, I added that. Um, amendment number two, um, and this, this reflects, I think it was, I think it was counselor, I'm not sure which counselor. Um, it may have been counselor, Liang, but it talked about involving the health department. And I think maybe a counselor Harris mentioned that too. So this is an amendment to the short-term residential registry, uh, section 196, subsection 14.6. And it just adds the following language at the end of that paragraph. Mm -hmm. A unit to be offered as a short-term rental must also undergo an inspection by the city's health department and must pass such inspection before being offered as a residential unit. And that would, uh, that would be in tandem with the requirement that the fire department uh, uh, give an inspection to the unit before, before it's registered, before, it's, before it can be offered as a short-term rental. The third amendment um, would be also to the short-term residential registry and it would add a subsection six, upon receiving an application from a prospective operator, 
of a short-term residential unit, the Department of Inspectional Services, DIS, shall notify the local ward counselor of the application by electronic mail. And uh, Councillor Crow had asked that this be part of the ordinance. So I've included that. The fourth amendment um, would just change some wording and that that's all that that is. And you, if you, if you look, look at that, it, it changes the, the word each to um, the word the. And amendment six, this would also be an amendment to the short-term residential registry in subsection four after the words, quote, a primary resident of the unit add the following, quote, or a primary resident of the dwelling in which the unit or units being offered as a short-term rental are contained. Um, so again, we're, we're trying, we're, we're trying to say that uh, in order to, to be an operator of a short-term rental unit, you have to have the dwelling as your primary residence. And I think that's, that's what I got from council is at the last meeting, that that's what they wanted to do with this ordinance. Uh, then amendment seven, which would be under section 196, subsection 14.6 B, there was some other requirements. And uh, it just, again, this just changes some words and it, it also reflects a change that counselor um, Kroll had requested the original ordinance said that direct butters must be informed of an application for a registration from a short for a short term rental, and Councillor Kroll wanted the notification to be for a butters within 300 feet of the unit. So I've included that as well, uh, and then Councillor Yang's concern about parking, I think is addressed in the eighth amendment, amendment number eight, which is also under section 196, subsection 14.6B under other requirements. Um, and I've just added another subsection, a subsection 10, which reads no short term residential unit shall be offered for rental unless such unit shall have adequate provision for on premises off street parking. Adequate parking is defined as at least one off street parking space per residential unit with such parking space being additional to a parking space for the dwelling owner. A prospective operator must certify such parking access at the time of registration with the city's residential rental registry. And this of course um, can be checked out by inspectional services before issuing the permit. And uh, then the last amendment is just, uh, it's, it's a typographical error. error. It uh, takes out the word off and inserts the word of. Um, so with these amendments, which, which I consider relatively modest minor um, changes um, to reflect council's uh, desires, um, th that's, I think it's, I, I think it's a good ordinance. I think it, um, it establishes some standards that um, operators would have to adhere to. And it allows the council and the city to get some control over these things and to protect neighborhoods. Um, and it also sets up the registry and it, it sets up a, a way for the city to collect fees um, for applications. And, uh, and, it, and it sets up a complaint process where if an operator doesn't comply with the standards as set forth in this ordinance, then there is a, a complaint process and there's enforcement process with, with money penalties, um, with fines. So I'm happy to answer or try to answer any questions counselors might have regarding the ordinance itself or the amendments that I've, that I've uh, proposed. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Durkin. Um, I'd like to um, open it up to my fellow colleagues to see if there's any questions that you may have in regards to the ordinance. And if um, if there are no questions, then we can move on to going through the sections to see if we are in agreement with um, the written ordinance. So if there's any questions, just let me know. Councilman Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Mr. Durkin, thank you for the uh, amendments. I actually didn't receive them in my email. Um, I must have got lost in cyberspace, but um, I, I, listening to you go through them, I, I appreciate them. They, they sound all very reasonable to me. Um, my only concern remains the, the same concern that I had the last time. Um, while we've gotten some additional information about what these properties are, um, it, it really only strengthens the concern that I had about uh, having a hard time voting on legislation that could cost someone their livelihood, uh, especially in these times, um, without hearing from them directly uh, or knowing the actual impact. Um, I, I suspect my colleagues got uh, a half dozen or so emails from folks today um, who were short-term rental owners or proprietors um, I had I spoken to one. I followed up with them. I spoke to, them, to one of them. They said that Airbnb had notified them um, uh, that this was on tonight and that they had just done so. So while that may cover some people, um, you know, it looks like there's 211, there's 211 properties. We heard from maybe six today. Um, and I just have a hard time voting on, for something that I don't know what the impact is going to be. Uh, on the average uh, person who's most affected. I mean, obviously I support keeping our residential neighborhoods residential, um, but after learning that the average monthly revenue is about $2,000, so the average Airbnb listing, in, or I'm sorry, short-term listing in, in Quincy is 211 total listings. That's about $24,000 per year, and that's just for the average. So that means some folks are likely earning a much higher revenue per year. That could be someone's full-time job. That could be their only source of income. I just don't understand enough about the people who are hosting these short-term rentals um, and their situations for me to be comfortable. Everyone can do what they want, but for me to be comfortable to vote on this tonight. Um, my my main question is, I, I would like to know, and we don't yet, because we don't have the the um, street numbers, just from the public listings of those 130 that are registered with the street with the, with the state, they just have the street names. I would like to be able to to cross reference how many are in a residential A neighborhood, and to be able to see how many are we actually impacting. Um, and second, you know, there's 211 total listings. Um, once we obtain the actual addresses, I would like to. I would suggest we mail those folks um, and let them know what, what we're talking about and see if they have any import and perhaps want to share with us their, you know, their personal experiences of how they're using Airbnb or short-term rentals, um, how much revenue they're deriving from it, how important it is to them. So I appreciate all the work that's gone in here and I hate to be, a you know, the, the ants at the picnic, but um, I won't be supporting this tonight because I'm not ready to vote for it. Um, if it does come up for a vote, I'll likely um, vote no, just because I'm not I'm not ready. Um, I I just I, I can't get over my worry of, especially in these times, taking away what's potentially someone's sole livelihood. Um, and I, and I don't fully understand uh, what some people's situations might be, what the what they're what they're actually renting out, whether the 62 percent of listings that are renting an entire home is that people who live there and they just, they just rent it out when they go on vacation, because you can do that, right? You can, when you go on vacation, you rent it out for a week, you know, a couple times a year. Um, is it, is it that? And if those are located in a, in a residential, a neighborhood, uh, w would I have a problem with that? I, I don't know that I would versus someone who rents, who owns a, a single family house in a residential neighborhood who is professionally managing the property and they rent it out every night. I would have more of a problem with that. So until I have a better idea of what these properties are, where they're located and how they're being used, I have a hard time 
being able to vote on this um, tonight. And, and then I'll throw the other piece out there that is there's 211 total active listings and only 130 of them are registered with the state. So, I mean, that's what a little, little over half. Um, so if we pass this ordinance, I would imagine that we're going to get a similar response rate, which I suspect doesn't solve anyone's problem that we're seeking to solve here because I'm, you know, I'm going to go out on a limb just based on past practice and knowledge of being a ward counselor that the folks who take the time to register and do the things that they're supposed to do aren't the folks who cause trouble in the neighborhood. They aren't the folks whose properties are, um, you know, derelict. And also finding out that there are, you know, maybe 30% of the total listings in the city are in Ward 4. In the past um, five years, I've, I've had two properties reported to me. One, um, I called the owner of the property uh, and he immediately took it off Airbnb and said, sorry, I didn't mean to be a problem in the neighborhood. And he stopped doing it. Um, the other one, uh, I got one call from a neighbor uh, who was just inquiring whether or not that property was listed on Airbnb. And so I called the property owner. I talked to him about it. And he said, yeah, we have a, we had an addition. There's a spare bedroom with like an in-law apartment on the second floor. We're always home and, you know, we rent it out. So I haven't, I suppose I've been lucky and fortunate that I haven't had the same kind of concerns raised that other counselors have had. And I certainly don't doubt that, but from my perspective, um, I'm just not ready to vote on it tonight. So I'll see what my counselors, my council colleagues have to say and kind of take it from there. So thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chairwoman. And thank you very much, Mr. Durkin, for all the work you've done on this. Thank you, Councilor Fauci. Uh, moving on to Councilor Harris. Uh, good evening. Um, thank you, um, Chairwoman. Um, and thank you, Mr. Durkin, for, for, for the hard work that you've done. Um, the numbers in Ward, uh, Ward Six, uh, you said 15, and I mean, I know of three, three in an area of less than a quarter of a mile. Of course, people are buying, and, and, and what's important is this legislation allows, and I spoke with, um, with, uh, with Mr. Duca, this legislation will allow us to go into places we know on waterfront property, million dollar homes that the people aren't living in, but are being rented out. They were advertised on Airbnb, but because of their constitutional right, the constitutional rights, I stood in front of the zoning board and was embarrassed by the lawyer that was, was arguing with me because I wanted to go into that 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 uh, building, and we weren't allowed to, and and it's a well-known fact right there, here, and it isn't just a Squanum issue, it's a, a North Quincy issue, um, anything around the water, um, you know, people are paying millions of dollars, uh, million and a half, whatever, and they buy them up, and then they put them on. Airbnb, and they charge enough money in order to preserve and hopefully make more money as the property values go up. Um, and I, I, I with, 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 with all due respect with, uh, with, 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 with um, Council Pamucci, I am, uh, my, the people in my ward are desperate for this to take place. Um, it's been mentioned on many zoning board meetings about um, waterfront property on Dorchester Street, on on uh, Crabtree, on 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 several 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 properties, um, Bellevue, that we know the wrong thing is being done, but the zone, but the but but Jay Duca's folks just don't have the power to do it. This, what we, we have in front of us tonight, gives them the opportunity. For there to be 15 people registered, that tells me the problem is the people aren't registering. Registering, They are doing the wrong thing. And we need to stop it. We need to protect resident A 
We need to protect neighborhoods, even if they're not resident A, from this happening, from frat parties taking place where you know, people have lived their whole lives uh, in North Quincy to have to deal with a, a frat house for a weekend. And that's what we have to protect. We have to protect the folks. Me, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna um, say uh, vote, vote. I'm not gonna say uh, I wanna approve it, um, make a motion to approve because I respect what, what, what Council Pamucci has said. But before we get into the the summer season before we get into COVID being in the rear mirror, rear view mirror of our cars. We need to get this through. We need it tight, as was said by, uh, quoted, uh, uh, Mr. Durkin quoted me and thank you. Uh, there needs to be teeth in this, this, and it does have teeth. Protecting resume is, is important. Those are the folks that are paying the most money in taxes. And I, 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 I hope that we can somehow come to an agreement to make sure this legislation takes place. And again, thank you, Mr. Durkin. Thank you, uh, thank you Chairman, uh, Chairman uh, Mahoney. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor Harris. I'm gonna move on to Councilor Phelan. Hey. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, who are you to, uh, to, to solicit a Dur assistant solicitor Durkin? Um, with these changes that you that you've recommended, would this require another advertising? Or are these considered minor changes? In my view, these are relatively modest changes. It doesn't really change um, the crux of the ordinance. Um, these are these are just uh, additions which um, it just just would be relatively minor, and I, I don't think that it would require a, an advertising again. Okay, thank you. Uh, just, just a quick comment on this. Um, I've, I've, I haven't been as lucky as my fellow counselor in Ward 4. Um, I've run into a lot of problems with these Airbnbs. One just on the 27th of December, at three o'clock in the morning, there was a there's a fight out on West Elm Street, where the several police guys had to come down and clear it out. It was a, the Airbnb was at the end by the beach, which is being used every open seems to open for business every night at ten o'clock, after after all the restaurants and bars closed down, and it has been a constant nuisance for the neighbors in that neighborhood. I've been working with the police, Mr. Duker, and the and the the thing, and. Not just that they're doing this, they're doing this during COVID times. No one had masks on, it was just a big party. And it happened as anyone can can ask for the police report. It happened at three o'clock in the morning on December 27th. I've got another one that happened just like it down on uh, West Elm at the other end, which was down by East Nazarene Green, Green College. And that was another thing where they, um, 100, 100 kids went to a party, it was a drinking party. Neighbors called the police, the police have to come break it up. It's not fair to put our police officers walking into these houses um, in this time of COVID and no one has masks on. So not only is it important, is this ordinance important just for the times we're in, it's important for the, for the people in those residence A neighborhoods that they can enjoy their property. When I was running for office, I ran into several on different streets um, they were not all occupied. Uh, the house was let to go. Uh, several cars were clogging the streets. Um, and maybe some of it's because I'm near the Wollaston. A lot of this is near the Wollaston T station and easy access to Boston. And I think although I, I respect uh, some of the things that Council Pamucci go up, I'm willing to take a look at some more things. I do think the crust of the, the ordinance is really needed. And people I've talked to from when I went to it, a door are really looking for this. So um, I'm willing to look at some more, some more things and debate it further. But for now, I think um, you know I'm ready to make these amendments. Maybe move on, work with the chairman to make sure 
that all the finer points are done, but I think we need to move on to this ordinance because I think we're either gonna have residents say or we're not gonna have residents say. And here's the choice. You gotta either allow it or are you gonna lose your whole whole residential character of the city? And I see it happening in a lot of a lot of streets. And um, I'm just very much for this. Thank you, Mr. Jerkin, for doing all the hard work you've done. And also uh, Chairman, Chairman Mahoney for, for having these meetings. I don't mind if we go a meeting or two just to iron out all the language, but I think we're going, we need to bring this forward before pandemics in our rear view mirror, before people start to rent these things again. I don't want to rob anyone of money, but I also don't want to, I also don't want to have people in that neighborhood who bought these houses in a residence A neighborhood left with this, what basically comes down to harassment. And uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll yield my time at this point, Madam Chairman, because I know you want to go through the yeah. ordinance and stuff. Thank you very much, Councillor Phelan. Um, I'm going to go to Councillor DeBoner and then Councillor McCarthy. So, Councillor DeBoner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank Mr. Durkin for all your hard work on this uh, legislation, um, with the amendments and just working from day one on this. I want to thank my colleagues for their input. It gives me a little bit of a better understanding of where we're at. And for me, um, as an at-large counselor, I've been dealing with a few of these over the last few years um, that have been issues. Um, I've not had any good, um, I guess, publicity or good input from these uh, short-term rentals, Airbnbs, at all. I've had nothing but issues with them um, in the in the different wards. Um, the main issue that I have is, especially in residential A, is the character and integrity of these neighborhoods, and they have a lot of families and a lot of children in these in these areas. And when you have people coming in and out of these um, short-term rentals, which you don't know who they are, you don't know what time they're out at night. Um, you got the police involved with uh, after hours and all these different things, not wearing masks, not abiding by the rules. Um, my main concern is public safety. And when I make a decision on something like this, um, they're running a business. So if they're running a business, in my personal viewpoint, why are they in residential A? Why are they in res A? Um, I would like to know as this body, this nine body council, where everybody falls into maybe excluding it out of residential A. Maybe even um, if there's you know 211 properties, finding out how many are in res A, having a vote to see where everybody stands on whether we want to continue to allow um, this to be in residential A or um, to exclude it. Um, a step further, it's if there's an amendment that anybody wants to put in that somebody that is existing has can be grandfathered in, and then no new existing, no new applications or um, new res a uh, short-term rentals or airbnbs um i you know this kind of reminds me a little bit of um council palmucci um in ward four bringing about our sober houses the sober homes and i remember it was an uproar um and, and not all of them were under mash the mass massachusetts alliance for sober living of sober housing and it kind of goes hand in hand with a little bit of this of the 211 properties there's only 130 that are registered, um, you know, right around a little more than half, maybe it's 55% of them. And um, Council Pamucci talking about roughly $2,000 monthly, around $24,000 yearly. Um, but for me, what's what's the benefits of, of us doing this when the downfall is the residents that live in these residential neighborhoods that want to raise a family and they don't want issues. I think some of the other things besides the issues with uh, public safety is the parking issue. Uh, that has been a main concern, off street parking, um, no, too many vehicles out there. There's already enough neighborhoods. Um, we're just talking about, I think East Elm or West Elm. Um, there's issues with parking in those neighborhoods. So you add an Airbnb or a short term rental and you in your parking two and three extra cars on the road, um, it's a problem for the residential people that wanna get in and out of their houses. Some of them don't have um, big driveways where they can fit a lot of vehicles in there. Another thing to consider is when it snows, you gotta move the vehicles, you can't put them on the streets, 
can't put them in the driveways. You got more and more as the city's growing. <laughs> we're at 100,000 people. I can tell you, if we did a consensus, which is this year, I I'm pretty sure we're there uh, with all the new um, dwellings that we have. So there's more people. There's not as, uh, as much space on the streets to put the parking. I mean, I think we need to take a hard look at um, a vote or um, going back to the drawing board and seeing where everybody lies with maybe excluding it in residential A. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards that just based on what I'm hearing from my other colleagues and what I'm hearing for the people um, that have raised their concerns to me. Um, I have an issue right now where um, there's a trailer, like a mobile home that's adjacent to an Airbnb short-term rental. And we've been going on this issue um, with, with uh, different fines and they're continuous to give different fines because but because of the court system being down right now and not being up and running with the COVID-19. Um, my main concern is their family. They're, my main concern is their, the, the children that they live with, you know, their, their kids. And for me, that's public safety problem. I, I, don't, I, I don't think we should be in the business of trying to, um, to earn money here or for, for the falter of these neighborhoods. So, I mean, it, it's a good understanding. I'm glad that Council Palmucci is not looking to maybe vote on anything tonight. I didn't have a fully understanding of where everybody kind of was with how they felt about everything. I'm kind of getting a consensus now with all the different councils speaking. Um, but I, I'm, I'm leaning towards excluding it from residential A. I can, I can tell you that much. And, uh, and the main reason is the integrity um, and the public safety of our neighborhoods. And, and we, I have a responsibility for the people that live there um, whether it be a renter that lives there or whether it be a homeowner that lives there. Um, and with the city growing in the, in the parking issue is another thing to consider. So I think, um, I think we need to get up to status with all the 211 properties that we have online right now and get everybody registered. Maybe we bring some type of legislation in with that and um, maybe work with the people that are, uh, that are on the 211 properties and really fine tune anybody else that's gonna be trying to come online to, to do a short-term rental. Um, we need better oversight. Um, the over, I mean, um, Mr. Durkin, if, if I can ask you, um, is there any type of, uh, like say for instance, uh, inspectional services, Jay Duca goes out and inspects it. What's the, what's the viewpoint of the future? Is there a yearly inspection? Is there, um, um, any type of inspection after the fact of the very first one. I don't believe that these standards call for an annual inspection. I'd have to read through it again, but it calls for an inspection at the beginning and certainly it allows for inspections if there are any complaints. So there's a, there's a complaint process yep. and uh, that would, that would trigger the, the inspectional services to go in and take a look at what's going on. Yep. there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, cause another thing is, is, um, is an oversight of photos. I know I know when you go online to look up an Airbnb or a short-term rental, they have photos online. Is there any type of way of having a file system for us, for the 211 properties or anybody that's new that there's a filing system of photos inside? For instance, um, them building or doing illegal um, rooms, illegal bathrooms, um, adding to the property with, um, okay, there are all, this, this says there's only two bathrooms in here. Why is there four bathrooms now? Um, and they're, they're actually marketing this on their Airbnb website. I've been having issues with that. that, that a couple of um, constituents have come to me and said, uh, Council, look, they're, they're actually marketing it for this. And on record, it only says it has this many rooms or this many bedrooms. Um, it's becoming an issue. And I, I, I'm glad that um, we brought this about and... Uh, we're on our second del uh, deliberation of this, but uh, I've had nothing but negative negative um, input from from the residents out there. Um, so, what what do you think, uh, um, Mr. Dirk? And do you think other? T what was the town that you would mention that that excluded all Airbnbs or short term rentals? Um, there were several uh, towns that that addressed this issue. Um, one town that took up the issue was the town of Linfield. And Linfield took up the issue after a murder happened at, okay. at one of their home share units. Yeah. Um, 
where there was a, a huge party and there was a fight and somebody was killed. And uh, so the town of Linfield amended its bylaws to exclude retroactively any Airbnbs, any short-term rentals within the town. And um, so that, that decision uh, of the town of Linfield was appealed to the land court. And the land court interestingly said, well, first of all, it said that uh, cities and towns may regulate short-term vacation rentals. It's, that, that's how it was worded in the decision. Um, and the issue was raised as to whether whether Airbnb's short-term rentals were, would be grandfathered in. Because, of course, uh, under, under zoning law, if, if you have, you know, in a particular neighborhood in Quincy where the home comes right out to the sidewalk – and then years later, the town passes a zoning ordinance that requires a setback, you know, several feet setback, whether it's 10 feet or 25 feet. And so the question is, you know, are they grandfathered in or do they have to change the house? Well, obviously, the answer is they're grandfathered in. Um, so the issue was raised whether um, the offering or the, the ability to use a property as a short term rental was a grandfathered use. And. The, the land court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts determined that that was not a grandfathered use. And they went through um, a whole rationale as to why that was the case. And what they said was because short, short-term vacation rentals, Airbnb style short-term vacation rentals are in the words of the court, ever-changing technologies that produce materially different uses as the technology changes. Um, and it also talked about the fact that, uh, you know, different people would be coming into these neighborhoods. And in this particular case, the court talked about residence A neighborhoods that were envisioned to be single family homes in a single family neighborhood and, and this, is a, this, this was a use that wouldn't be grandfathered in because they never got a permit for it. And uh, so the land court allowed, allowed uh, this retroactive ban on Airbnbs within the town of Linfield. Now, that land court decision is currently under appeal to the Massachusetts Appeals Court, I understand. I actually read one of the briefs. But I don't think it's I don't think it's been decided yet. That was appealed in 2019, I think. 2019, yeah, 2019. Thank you for your information, Mr. Dirk. And that's what I wanted to hear. There was so there was a somebody got murdered inside of a uh, Airbnb short-term rental in Linfield. Is that correct? Linfield, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, there were some that's other towns one of my too. Other concerns as well. I mean, um, the oversight, the oversight on these these type of um, properties, I guess I could say, it concerns me. And I'm, I'm thinking about how our city's growing, our public safety, putting the stress on our, our um, you know, inspectional services department, our health department, our police officers, um, having our firefighters have to go out there and inspect this beforehand. Is that, is that correct? They have to look at the um, fire department. The fire department has to go out and inspect the uh, different um, carbon monoxide and, and you know the uh, smoke detectors and all that other stuff i just i feel like it's a, it's a stressor and i don't want to open a can of worms to continue this so for me i mean as i'm as i'm thinking about this i'm i'm really considering residential a and eliminating them um in the city of quincy from here on out and that and obviously i have to um have to get the get the votes from the rest the rest of the council but i'm leaning towards it i'm going to be honest with you i've been thinking about this for the last two years with dealing with some of the uh, constituents out there and it's my responsibility as a council to step up to the plate and help these residents especially when they have families in their resident in the residential area so i mean i'm going to yield my time um i don't think there's going to be a vote tonight but if, if we want to go down that avenue i'm open for it um, um whether we or you're, if you're somewhere in the middle as a counselor and you want to give them a grandfathered in i i don't know where we're going to go with this but i i know where i feel and I want, I'm trying to tell the rest of my count, fellow counselors how I feel about it and where they lie on this. So 
Thank you, Mr. Dirk. And I know I'm going to yield my time to other counselors to get their viewpoint, get their input. Um, I, I recommend to the rest of the counselors to speak up so we have a consensus of where we want to go. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll look to, to, to get some more insight down the road. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilor Bowen, you might want to check um, part 196, 14-4 for ineligible residential units. It does cover um, residential A. So that I think it covers some of the things that you're concerned with, but if you if you take a look at that. Um, with Councilor McCarthy, I'm going to go to Councilor Harris first because he wanted to follow up on something that Councilor Devona had, and then I'll go to, I, we'll close this and open up, potentially open up the um, council meeting and come back. So Councilor Harris. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to yield to Councilor McCarthy real quickly. Thank you. Okay, Council McCarthy. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Councilor Harris. Um, I'm ready to vote on this tonight. Uh, I think um, Mr. Durkin's amendments um, put in some great stringent restrictions on folks that want to do this. Um, as you just pointed out, Mrs. Mahoney, Res A is in the 14.4 section uh, on page three. Uh, I side with uh, my fellow colleague in Ward 5 and in Ward 6, uh, Councilor Phelan and Harris, and I've had um, episodes that compare to Councilor uh, Phelan um, where uh, I've noticed and I've done a little <clears throat> investigative work with um, our great community police group uh, when we've had Airbnb issues or Airbnb um, rumors and we've looked into it. And what I found out is that a lot of them will rent from the beginning of the week till Thursday night. And Thursday night, the nice family of two with a quiet two kids will leave and move on and go on their way. And Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night, which everybody knows are not the nights that people stay in, it uh, explodes. Um, so um, I think that everything that um, Assistant City Solicitor Durkin did fits the bill. Uh, it, it covers it. All the additions of the counselors' amendments cover a few more things people have to do. And, and, and Res A is, um, it's a great start in my opinion. I, I not a big fan of Airbnb. Um, and so, um, Res A is a place to start as we know that zeroes in on our, um, uh, residential neighborhoods. I know that I have that number. I think we said seven, probably more like 12. And I know I have a few that are, um, uh, in residence B, um, right on the outskirts uh, of, um, right on the border of A, uh, in a few locations. So um, I look to move tonight on this. I'd like to make a motion um, to approve the proposed amendments first to Council Order 2021-25 and put that in the form of a motion. Okay, we have a motion on the table. I know we have a couple of other counselors that still want to speak. A motion. Second the motion. And we have a second on the motion by Mr. Harris. Um, Mr. McCarthy, are you all set? Mr. Harris, would you want to speak? Well, yes, sir. Council, Council Mahoney, I just wanted to say that um, if the amendments get approved, then, um, you know, I would either um, colleague, I don't know if, if Councilor Harris was going to do it or not, I'd like to make a motion uh, to approve the um, to approve the whole ordinance and, and move forward. And I Thank second, you. I, and I so second, we have a second for that. So, we have a couple of councils that still want to speak. Thank you, Mr. McCar Council McCarthy. Um, Councilor Harris? Yes, and just uh, the, um, as uh, Councilor DeBona mentioned about Linfield, it, it's all a common denominator what's going on, what goes on. Um, ward one, Chuck's ward, my ward, oceanfront property. It's the number one place. It's res A, it's people that are buying property that are trying, uh, that are trying to, uh, you know, you know, invest, make money. Um, but again, any good uh, responsible uh, property owner would be living there, and there's no argument about it. We have we have a problem 
whenever you have, and it, and it goes right all the way up uh, the, the East Coast and all, probably all the way down, down to Florida when it comes to Airbnb. Some of them are good, some of them are great. But right now, when you don't have the restrictions, you don't have the, uh, the bite, as we said, um, I support this uh, um, and I thank uh, Council McCarthy for, 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 um, ra um, for, for raising it. And uh, I, again, second the motion. And um, this, is, this is all about the people and quality of life. I mean, the folks, folks are paying too much in taxes to have somebody who comes in and, and just can ruin a street and ruin people's uh, uh, summers like last year. I know in Squanum. So I'm I'm all in, and I hope I hope everybody understands uh, where I'm coming from. And, um, and 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 thank you, thank you, um, Madam Chair, for letting me speak. I appreciate it. Thank you, Council Harris. Um, we have five minutes before we have to open the council meeting. Uh, Councilor Yang, would you like to speak with the knowledge that we're five minutes away? Um, I can hold off until you come back, if that's okay. So Please. we have a motion on the floor, seconded by um, by Bill Harris. I'm going to suspend the ordinance meeting because um, we only have five minutes left, and um, we'll um, open the council meeting at 7:30, and then we'll come back to the ordinance meeting. If that's okay. All right. Thank you, everybody.
Welcome back, everyone. So we're going to formally convene the Monday, January 11th, 2021 City Council meeting. Madam Clerk, could you call the roll, please? Councilor Kane. Present. Councilor Kroll. Present. Councilor DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Council Mahoney. Present. Council McCarthy. Present. Council Palmucci. Present. Council Phelan. Present. President Liang. Present. Nine members, you have a quorum. Thank you. I just ask that everybody respectfully um, mute themselves right now <coughs> in honor of a moment of silence for all of the women and men who are serving both here and abroad, as well as keeping in mind all of the frontline workers who are still fighting this pandemic. Thank you. Madam Clerk, could you read the open meeting law, please? Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Thank you. And in accordance with Governor Charles D. Baker's March 10, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law Chapter 30, Section 20. This Quincy City Council is holding this city council meeting via remote video conferencing services and is being aired on Quincy Access Television, QATV, channel QATV9 Government Access. And we're going to go ahead and just start with um, how we've been starting off all of our meetings with honoring of our COVID-19 heroes, and then we'll go back into the Ordinance Committee meeting. But I'm really excited to uh, turn it over to Councilor Harris to uh, bring in tonight's heroes. Councilor Harris. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Madam President. And I am I am very excited to be able to uh, this evening um, honor the, the folks who work at um, Manic Community Health Center. Um, today, when I was, was putting my thoughts together and I, I went on to the website, um, the first thing that stuck out at me, and I don't know if you can see it, is on their website, it says, and now it's backwards, it says, all are welcome here and isn't that so true but the work they do the work that the folks at uh, manit does for the city of quincy is and has been during this uh tr very trying time has been extraordinary um i'm gonna I mention the folks who um in a few minutes who i think are, are on with us but uh, I'm going to just throw out some of the things that that just Manit has done, and what Manit does, and um, you know, a line that I a line that I was given, and and it's like, it it just really touches from infants to elders. Manit Community Center is a model care, uh, a model care facility. And, um, and 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 it's their their focus of of that that is, has has led them to the forefront of of helping the people of Quincy during this this very 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 trying time. Um, a couple of things that they they have been doing is, um, for instance, uh, down at Father Bill's, they've been. Uh, testing at Father Bill's, the staff and the, the patients and the people that are there to assure that the safety of, of, of that, that um, very important place in, in, in our community. And also, um, and also they, uh, uh, last, last Tuesday, they started pre-testing, um, uh, they started pre-testing folks um, at, just behind the Central Middle School at the, at, I think it's, uh, yeah, old, 180 Old Colony. In four hours, they tested 376 people. And this is nothing new to them. They've been, they've been doing that. Um, and today, you know, if you watch the news, they came out and said, you know, they showed all the first responders getting um, tested, but they were doing it uh, they were doing doing it before the 
the state was doing it. And that 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 leads to the folks that 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 work um, at um, the Manic Community Center. And of course, uh, I'm going to uh, mention um, the CEO, uh, Cynthia Sierra. Uh, her insight on va va vaccines what has um, put Quincy ahead of of other uh, other cities and 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 and, it's, and and this is a true honor to her 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 leadership her um, you know uh, her leadership as well as her to her folks who work for her and um, I'll, I'll mention two other folks that are, are on on as well and 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 they can speak if they want but I hope Cynthia speaks because I, I could be shortchanging them what they do uh, in, in the course during this 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 really difficult time and what they've done for Quincy. Um, of course, is Kim Kroger. Uh, uh, she's the manager of prevention and outreach services. And then there's Dr. Lily Young, chief medical officer. So all I can say is that um, through Cynthia's leadership, uh, she inspired people, I mean, at a time that, that healthcare workers, no matter who you are, that we wanted, there's fear. And, but her strength and her leadership is what is, is, is truly why we're honoring them. And I'm proud to be honoring them tonight. And so with that, um, I would like to introduce Cynthia Sierra, if I've said your name wrong, I've said a million names wrong on the, on these things. So, but I apologize, but um, I just wanna say thank you so much. And I'd love you to tell everybody what your staff has done, uh, every, any of the experiences that, you, 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 that can come to mind and especially the other folks, uh, um, Dr. Lilly and of course, um, Kim Kroger, uh, if, if they like to speak, so. With that, um, uh, Madam Madam President, could we um, pop Cynthia on? Is she online? Absolutely. Today? Thank you. Mm -hmm. She should be unmuted now. Yes. Thank you, Council President Liang. Thank you, Councilor Harris, and you said it perfectly. Um, my name is Cynthia Sierra, and frankly honored to be here this evening with all of you, and, and, and thank you, Councilors, for your work. Um, and city colleagues. And I, I had the distinction of being with uh, two amazing leaders that um, I'm going through um, pandemic with, and, and that's Dr. Lily Young, 20 years of service to this health center, uh, and an amazing physician, a board certified internal medicine physician, and also a medical executive. And, um, and right across the hall from me, she works. And there's um, such an honor in, in that relationship. And, and I think Lily has uh, really in some ways become the city's physician and so proud of her for that. And Kim Kroger, who I've had uh, the honor and opportunity to work with for several years um, and different roles that I've had here at the health center. So Kim manages our prevention services, but so critically important right now, she is the director of our COVID-19 field team. And uh, so just two, two staff members that, um, that uh, exude excellence in what they do, uh, the teams that they lead. I, I have to say, Council Harris, there's, um, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about three very special ingredients to a community health center. And, uh, and one is an unparalleled, unmatched, dedicated community health center staff that since um, uh, our opening, but in particular over the course of the last uh, several years, um, uh, understands what our charge is, understands what our role is, understands that our patients that we see for primary care, for mental health care, for addiction care, um, we are, are not taking care of all of their needs if we're not mindful of the community and the public health needs in the community and partnering with professionals like your commissioner, um, Commissioner uh, Ruth Jones, of course. Uh, but also, um, and it might be a little known fact, our board of directors, and we're so proud of this, our board of directors, federally qualified health centers like Manit, they have to be majority patients. So what an honor and distinction that is for us 
to be governed, my role in particular, to be governed by the patients that come to us for their care. So such an honor. You almost can't go wrong with that. And then third is courageous and compassionate partnerships such as we have with the city of Quincy and reflecting back um, to the early days. And I remember in uh, January and February and, 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 and watching as, as far as would unfold, but particularly in March and with Congressman Lynch and with Mayor Koch and, you know, what is it that that MANA can do to help? Um, and so it just came quite naturally to us, uh, uh, the, the testing experience. Now we are moving into the vaccine experience and um, an extension of of who we are in serving our patients again is serving the community. And and yes, the extraordinary work that, that happens around testing, both, if you will, um, closer to the work of the clinics, but also now, if you will, in the field. And uh, and all are welcomed here. And, and so, so well said, um, Councillor Harris, all are welcomed. And for us, um, it was a commitment to prioritize testing and making sure that no one was left behind uh, from care or from testing and how important that experience is. And, uh, and Lily and Kim both bring that compassion to the experience. Um, and I think also serving as uh, technical advisors and guides and teachers, uh, a really important part. So uh, I, I, I uh, just, all of us, just uh, so grateful and appreciative for this recognition um, and, and know we're proud and happy to do it and uh, and so and so uh, committed to this city and this community and so Manit as we know is Latin for it remains and so I think so well said and our founders and and around the city of Quincy uh, uh, properly named us as as, as such because Manit does remain um, and we're, we're honored uh, to be here so thank you so much thank you Council President Liang thank you Thank you so much. And I do just want to, um, before I turn it over to my colleagues, as I know they're really excited to chat with you as well, is um, just offer the floor to Kim and Dr. Young. If either of you would like to unmute yourself, please uh, feel free to jump in. Um, thank you all. Um, I'm just going to echo what Cynthia said. Um, I work with an amazing team. Um, we work in an amazing city and um, we will continue to do this work to serve the city and our patients. Thank you, Dr. Young Kim. Yes, and I'd just like to say thank you again and echo everything um, Cynthia and Dr. Young has said. I work a lot in the community. I am often the one out there um, working with a lot of the different agencies and it's such a great city to work in um, as well as I live here. So it's um, a pleasure, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleagues who I know um, some folks want to say something. So, uh, Councilor Kane, we'll go to you first. Thank you, Madam President. Um, hi, Cynthia. Hi, Kim. Hi, Dr. Young. Nice to see you all. Um, I'm filled with immense pride because, man, it sits in Ward 3. We're uh, proud supporters of the organization. And if you didn't know Manit before, you certainly know them now, but they have been a strong community partner. They fulfill a healthcare need for uh, those who might be underserved in the community most often. And it's such a, 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 a wonderful thing to have an organization like Manit uh, right in our backyard who has really stepped up to the plate to, to meet the needs of the city at this such an important time. And um, so I thank you for being here tonight. I thank you for all your efforts and um, we, we support you and uh, we are grateful for all of your efforts. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, Councillor Kane. Councillor Pramuchi. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I just wanted to very briefly. I just wanted to say, um, offer my appreciation, say thank you to the to the folks at Manit. Uh, you really have, uh, over the course of this pandemic, you really have been um, the tip of the spear in the city's fight. Uh, and I thank you for all of the hard work that you've done. Uh, Manit really is a, a you know you're a community health center, uh, and you meet the very definition of what a community a good community health center is. You've been a true partner. Uh, with the community, um, serving all ages and all populations and serving them very well for a long time. And most importantly, when our city and its residents uh, needed you guys the most, you stepped up, uh, you were there for the residents of Quincy, 
in the most dire of times. And we're all thank you. We're all thankful to you for being one of our COVID heroes in our city. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Pamanchi. Councilor McCarthy. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, <clears throat> Cynthia Kim, um, Dr. Young, uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, as Councilor Kane said, uh, I have the uh, the honor also of having Manit in Germantown and Howes Neck and um, you folks, um, well, you just became part of the neighborhood, part of the community, part of the partnership of the city. Um, you can never go away, I guess. Uh, you know, uh, you're a great institution. Uh, what you've done and how and you always do uh, when we have um, any type of crisis in the city, um, as my colleague says, you step up. Uh, this one was um, definitely 2020 was a little different and uh, definitely a, um, a tough one. And uh, you folks uh, are always there. So uh, I know on behalf of Ward 1 and all the folks that speak very highly of Man at Health, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mahoney? Um, I'm just gonna echo uh, my colleagues and thank you very much because as they said before, COVID has just taken over um, both our community, our state, our country, our world, but Manit did really step up and played a critical part um, with the way we're able to take care of our constituents and be able to test them and be a source of information. Um, prior to COVID, you were already doing that, serving our population and taking care of us and has become an even more critical part of our city now that we don't have a hospital. Manit Health has stepped up in multiple ways, in many ways. And um, more importantly, you have been the group that's really been able to help us together on the front line. And I know a lot of people when, we, when first coming out with the testing, um, people were concerned about how close it was to neighborhoods and how they were gonna handle it. It was done with nothing but professionalism. And you know, in the access that you're allowing people has really helped keep our community um, as a safe ground in some ways. Even though COVID is, is all around us, uh, Manit is there as a resource for our constituents. And I can't tell you how much it means to me to know that if I need to recommend anybody that you can go to Manit and that you're there to help support them. So thank you very much for all the hard efforts that you're doing, the knowledge that you have, the information that you're sharing with our community and, um, and for always being there, whatever the needs are for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor DeBona? Thank you, Madam uh, President. I um, just want to echo the same as my colleagues. I just want to say just thank you for all your hard work and the partnership that you've had with the city of Quincy. It's um, it's great to, to see you guys out in the front of uh, right in front of this COVID-19 pandemic and um, your, your leaders on the forefront. So thank you so much for your um, hard work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And of course, I just want to wrap up um, before I let all of you go and just say thank you to I, you know, I unfortunately had to get tested. Um, not too long ago and I went to Manit and the process from beginning to end was so smooth and so assuring. Um, your nurses did a phenomenal job. It did not hurt and was not painful um, to get the test and you know just from the bottom of my heart I'm so grateful and when I went through the process I noticed that um, a lot of the materials if not all the materials actually were translated as well um, and that's so deeply important especially right now when you are on the front lines of all of this you know and you are there to serve and to make sure that you are providing resources to those who need it. So just from the bottom of all of our hearts as you can tell uh, we're just so grateful to all of you um, and thank you so so much please stay safe and council harris i know that you know uh, just respecting and honoring all healthcare workers is so important and i'm so glad that you brought Manit to us tonight so that we could all express our deepest gratitude so thank you all so much please stay safe and have a good night thank you take care good night all right so with that folks i'm going to recess the regularly scheduled council meeting so that we can open up ordinance and then we'll come back to this later thank you Okay, so we're going to reopen the ordinance meeting or re resume it. I don't think I need a roll call vote for that, so we're just going to reopen it, correct? Okay, so we left it off in ordinance um, that we had a motion for um, the regulation on short term rentals made by Mr. McCarthy, seconded by um, Councillor Harris. Um, Councillor Elaine, we're all set when we, we broke. I just had a question about um, process. Um, so, Mr. Durkin, if you could just explain, you know, logistically, 
if and when it passes, right? Like, let's say, for example, if it passed tonight, um, logistically, what's the process now for next steps and implementation um, for the city, as well as for those who are operating an Airbnb? Hold on one second. I'm just going to ask you to unmute yourself. If the council would have passed this tonight uh, with or without amendments, um, well, the next step would be for the mayor to sign it and then it would be enacted as, a, as an ordinance of the city. And then um, in light of the provisions in the ordin ordinance that would require some action by the Department of Inspectional Services, um, which does a great job with everything we ask them to do, it seems, um, they would have to get up and running. Um, technically, as it's worded right now, uh, this ordinance would become effective upon passage, which is the final wording um, at, at, the, at the bottom of the ordinance. Um, so it, it would take some time, I think, for inspectional services to get organized so that it could uh, begin accepting applications for registration for, for um, short-term rentals. And it would have to obviously set up, a, set up a process by which it would inspect these properties, process the applications, um, inform counselors, um, it would have to set up a process to handle complaints, you know, it's, uh, it's complaints that are particular to, to short term rentals. And, uh, so, so then it could be, then it could be up and running. And I think that would be, that would take the, that would probably take the longest amount of time. Um, and before we say anything else about that, um, I've, I've been giving some thought to, taking some action in addition to this um, ordinance that I would have to talk to uh, the mayor's office about. And um, I would talk, have to talk further with, with uh, Jim Timmons and Jay Duca, but I think it may be prudent for, for the city in addition to passing an ordinance like this, also to um, pass an additional ordinance that would amend the zoning code uh, to reflect some of the standards that are in here and to address the issue of residence A. Um, and, I, and I say that because there's, there's some case law that suggests that this might be a prudent approach and sort of a, a belt and suspenders approach at the very least. So that's something we could do, but it shouldn't, it really shouldn't um, delay passage of this ordinance before you tonight if that's what if that's what the council desires. Okay, thank you. So there's um, your response, I, as I'm understanding it, is twofold. One has to do with the timeline, and the second piece of it has to do with something else entirely different, yeah, the, right? The <laughs> with the zoning the, change. Okay. Um, yeah, the so, second. Go ahead. The second part of the question, counselor, correct me if I'm wrong, would be uh, what would this mean for owners, operators of these short term? residential units and where would this put them? Yeah, I mean, so I just, you actually answered it in the first part of um, your answer when you said that, you know, once it's, if and when it's passed, right, and then it's signed off, um, even though the language says it's effective upon passage, I mean, again, logistically, realistically, you know, it doesn't mean that the minute afterwards, it's, you know, in full effect to the part that, you know, we are able to start collecting and that the you know, systems are already in place. It sounds like there is still going to be some time between when it's voted on and the actual start and implementing of it, right? Because, you know, as you had said, there needs to be these processes that are set up to process the applications, to set up a notification um, sort of medium to the counselors and to this body, as well as um, set up a way to manage and handle complaints, right? So it sounds like upon upon passage of it, if it passes, there is still some time between it actually getting started, correct? 
in order for this to be effective and to work effectively, it requires it would re- require some administrative organizational efforts on the part of no, of course, special and, and services, and uh, yeah, health I'm department, not fire just, department. I'm just thinking logistically. Yep. Yeah. Okay. No, that makes sense. And so, um, if there's any changes that we need to make, you know, if and when it's actually um, starting, right? That's always something we can always do is make some ordinance changes and make some updates to this as we move forward. Yeah, and if I if I could just um, maybe interject, I mean, this is a policy issue, and I'm not I'm not here to create policy, but um, Councilor Palmucci um, made an important point about the existing short-term rentals that are in Quincy and operating as short-term rentals, and some of them are registered with the state, and some of them apparently aren't. Uh, but it may be a good idea for the city, maybe inspectional services, um, to notify these these operators the current operators of an ordinance that may be going into effect and it will affect them i agree and and that's that's my thought process right now in talking to you about this is that it sounds like you know i mean certainly i don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of good for for anything right and um you know that's i think the thing with ordinances right is that we can go back and make amendments even if and when they are passed we can always go and make changes to things passed even decades ago you know and so just making sure that there's clarity on that. But with this in particular, you know, it sounds like even upon passage, again, there is still that that period in between where inspectional services um, has to work to create these systems, like you said, with the fire department, the health department. And I think that's a great opportunity, it sounds like, to engage even with those um, who are Airbnb owners, you know, to talk about the registration process with them and what that looks like and working with ISD in that process too. So again, it sounds like, you know, with the implementation, um, before it actually does officially, officially start, it sounds like there's a lot of work um, procedurally that needs to happen before that. Um, and that work that is being done procedurally to set all of those systems up sounds like it could be inclusive of conversations with Airbnb owners. And so that's really, you know, that gives me a lot of assurance that they are um, still going to be part of this process and that changes can still be made down the line um, once we start getting the ball rolling on this and talk, you know, start talking about specifics and how we roll it out. So I appreciate the clarity. Um, and again, just wanted to make sure that there is still time to, you know, make any necessary changes as we move forward with this. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'm going to um, move on to Councilor Harris. And I do have, um, if nobody else is going to speak, I'll have a couple questions as well. So Councilor Harris. Uh, thank you again. Um, it's, I, it's very important that, you know, I hear what uh, uh, Mr. Jerkin says. I would, uh, if, if it's a matter of a friendly amendment added to it, I feel that anybody who's already registered as of if we vote tonight and this goes through, that anybody who's registered should be giving some type of timeline. But anybody who hasn't been registered, anybody who's been breaking the law, we need to get, this will give, no matter you know all the ins and the outs, this will give inspectional services the opportunity to hold people accountable that have been breaking the law, have been doing the wrong thing for a very long time. And that's, I just, that's all I want to want to say about that. If, if, if I have to make a, a, a friendly amendment that anybody that's, um, that anybody that's, you know, uh, already registered, yeah, everybody should have a chance to be able to, uh, you know, prepare for prepare for the fact that enough, we've had enough with a lot of what's been going on in our neighborhood. So, um, with that, I, I if I have to make a friendly amendment to that, but I think that if it's voted immediately, it should it should definitely uh, anybody who isn't registered, uh, I think inspectional services go for it get right in there half the teeth that i've been looking for thank you thank you madam chair hey Clarence harris um um i might need a point of clarification mr durkin um quincy when we have a state registry that that i think what was said was we have 211 in quincy of which 130 are registered with the state this is a separate registry that the inspectional services will be registering everybody in quincy is that correct that's correct. Okay, so we wouldn't be going after what's not registered in the state, but we would be trying to register all of the, all of the parties that are Airbnbs as we know them in Quincy. 
So you'll be sending out a notification to all of all of them, correct? Well, that's that's not in this ordinance, but okay. that's that would that would be something that would probably make sense. Yeah. So, so people who are currently operating a a short term rental, um, cool. this would be a way to to speed up the process, and it would be a public service to let people know that this is this is now a law. So, and the other thing, if we could just recap um, for people who are watching at home, this ordinance, what's the cost to the Airbnb to register themselves in Quincy as an Airbnb, separate from the state, just to, reg to register? To, is there a cost that goes with registra registering? Yeah, there's an, application, there's an application fee. Yep. Um, the, it would be, uh, where's the application fee? The registration fees are under section 196, subsection 14.9. The annual registration fee is $50. So a business, um, with a business that's not in residential A, an Airbnb that's not a resident A, would um, that met the qualifications for an Airbnb would be $50 a year. Correct? $50 a year, that's for a limited share unit. So okay. that would be like, um, that would be like a room yeah. in, in a home. Uh, annual registry for a home share unit shall be $200. Annual yeah. registration fee for an owner adjacent unit would be $200. Okay, but that's a year. So, and these are businesses that as um, Council Pamuji pointed out, it's not high volume, but that is not a, it's not a gigantic fee that we're asking them for registration. It just gives us the identification of who they are, where they are, and um, that they are registered. And, and then it brings me to the second question, which um, which kind of falls along the lines of what Councilor um, Liang was speaking to, which is kind of the process. Um, so should, uh, um, should, should somebody be fined if we go to the fine section? Is it a civil fine that they would be fined for that $100 fine? And then um, how, would, how is the ordinance enforced? I think this, is, this, this goes to what she was saying, but I'm just, it's a process that has to be worked out. I do think that these things need to be kind of worked out so that the business, um, the Airbnb businesses that are that are eligible to be opened in Quincy, they understand what goes along with the the fine, like how it's going to be enforced, how they're going to be paid, and then um, how is it collected, and then is there an appeal process? I'm just curious, you know, like when we put an ordinance like this into impact, what's that other what's that other portion of it so that we are protecting the city as well? Okay, yeah, so. Um, there is an enforcement process. It's an all set. Out, it's all set out here. Um, there's an appeal process. You know, if they if they are fined for violating the the standards of the ordinance, they can appeal that, um, and and then the inspectional services would have a, have a hearing and they would hear the appeal, and then they would make a decision. You know, whether to impose the fine or not. Um, as far as enforcing a fine, that's enforced under. Mass General Laws Chapter 40, Section 21D. Okay. Um, so we have the authority to do that. Again, when we're communicating, I guess, I guess I understand that, I guess there's two folds. It's kind of the process in which we're going to try to register people in the city of Quincy that are businesses that are eligible to be here, making sure that they understand that this is the process and making sure that they understand the penalties and then how we're going to be enforcing it. Those are the key parts. I did get several communications. Um, I didn't get as many as Council Pomucci. Um, people who are concerned because Airbnbs have worked for their families here visiting, especially with COVID. However, regular businesses pay business fees for having businesses and Airbnbs that are making income off of your individual home. It's not a, we're not asking for a lot. We're just asking to register them so that we know who they are so that we can keep an eye on to make sure that's the, that's the genesis of this ordinance, correct? It is. It is, Councillor. You're absolutely right. I mean, when I was asked to draft this, mm -hmm. I was asked by councillors um, to see what we could do to get a, a better way to, to get a, a handle on what's going on with short-term mm -hmm. rentals in this city and mm -hmm. to have some control and to have some regulation. And so mm -hmm. that's what this attempts to do. So I was just trying to wrap that up. I, 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 um, I appreciate all the work that you've done. So we do have a motion um, on the floor from 
And I, I wanted to check before I go to this point, is there any other counselors that have any other questions or who haven't spoken that would like to speak? I know Councilor Harris does, so I'd like to, um, to check to see if there's anybody else before I go to Councilor Harris. Okay, of course I can't see anybody. So I'm gonna go to Councilor Harris because he did want to speak. No, no, that was that was I I, I that was an earlier text. Uh, okay. Thank, okay. And then, thank you, Chairman. Okay, then we have Councilor Devona. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I just just want to elaborate. I know you would mention it, um, um, Madam Chair, on the um, ineligible rental units on 196-14.4 under number one under the short-term rental um, residential rentals in City of Quincy. So residential in this legislation, this residential A district as defined in city uh, Quincy zoning regulations as such forth. So there will be no residential A. Is that correct, Mr. Durkin? Well, what what this says is that dwellings or any portions of dwellings that are in a residential A district would not be eligible to be used for short term rentals. OK, so what about the existing residential A's that are out there right now um, that are using our short term rentals. What about them? Well, what we're saying is what I'm saying is that um, we're, we're saying that they can't have them in residence A districts. And I, my understanding is that's what the council wants. And okay. as I just indicated a few moments ago, uh, my thought is to make this airtight and to prevent challenges to this that we probably ought to consider amending the zoning code as well, which is something I could draft by the next meeting. And uh, as I said, it would be like a belt and suspenders um, approach to, to doing what the city wants to do to restrict short term rentals. So if an existing in single in single family home neighborhoods. Okay. So as of, right now if this legislation passes that if somebody is running a short-term rental in a residential a they have to cancel that they have to be eliminated is that correct well the, under the law they, they're going to have to register it try to register it and they're going to be told that they're not eligible well, okay what if because, they're not registered right now pardon they're well they can't registered. be registered in the city be because we don't have a registration yet okay we have we're, we're talking about our own registry, not the states, but our own. Not with the state, okay. Of the 130 that are registered right now with the state, do you know of anybody in residential A? I don't know where these are. I, all I have is streets, and some of them some of them look like they're, they may be in residence A neighborhoods, but others clearly are not. Okay. Because um, that's that's really my main issue is, is trying to get an ex excluding any type of residential a short-term rental and basically um because they're running a business if they're running a business why do they need to kind of be in our neighborhoods in the in, in the um in res a um so do you need to redraft this if you need to make sure that it sticks is that is that making sure the legislation well, i'm not talking about redrafting this ordinance I'm, whether this ordinance passes or not what I'm talking about is amending the zoning code. Okay. Either, but in addition to this, that's okay. that's my thought right now. So, why would we need to pass it now? Can we can we so we can make an amendment to this vote tonight and add it to the legislature, just add it to the ordinance, or would it have to be a separate ordinance? Would have to be a separate ordinance. What okay. I'm suggest what I'm suggesting tonight, if the council so desires, if it wants to pass this ordinance, the main ordinance, my yeah. suggestion is that it take up the nine amendments first. Okay. And if the, and if those pass, then yeah. then you have the main ordinance with the amendments to be voted on at that point in total. That would be my suggestion tonight. And then going forward, what I'm talking about doing is to draft an amendment to our zoning code, which is separate from this. Okay. And that is just to make this um, airtight and to prevent legal challenges because, you know, we, we don't know what, what could happen if there are legal challenges. This is a new area of the law. There really aren't many cases out there on it. 
And um, what about places like, um, let's just say places like Las Vegas, Nevada? I mean, they must have an abundance of of these Airbnb short-term rentals. I I heard they're having a lot of issues over there. Just policing and and like oversight and, you know, right now we're at 211 properties, but who knows what can happen illegally, you know? how yeah, do you feel Las that? Vegas, Nevada has their own laws, and they may be quite different than the laws of Massachusetts. So, you know, m- my advice would be not to focus on what's going on in Nevada, but just in Massachusetts. Yeah, it's just, it's just, as our city's growing, I'm just concerned with um, our oversight on this and making sure that it, it's, it's a, so getting back to the registr- registrate, um, getting it registered. Right now, it's 130 under the Massachusetts of the 211 properties we are going to try to make this uh, ordinance to make sure that everybody's registered is that correct is that in this yeah. ordinance and th- this ordinance calls calls upon everyone who wants to do a short-term rental to apply for a registration with the city of quincy and you know and if and if, and if they're registered to comply with the standards and requirements as set forth in this, in this ordinance okay um I, I just want to move in the right direction in general. I know we've been kind of deliberating on this and get this in motion. I know um, your personal viewpoint on some of the people that have had, um, you know, violations. Um, do you know if the court has been able to um, issue them to, you know, uh, these violations that go into effect? I don't know of any violations because counsel, one thing's for certain is that we don't have any standards in Quincy yet about, about short-term rentals. I mean, there can be violations of the building code, but that's separate from this. Separate from this. Okay. You know, All they, right. They can't, they, there could not have been any violations yet because we don't have any standards for them to okay. meet. Right. That's so what this does. There's other issues with violations with other housing situations that I'm already dealing with in general. But, um, okay. I, that's really all my questions that I have. And I'm glad that you know, I know some of my fellow counselors are, are looking to get this into into passage. So, um, my uh, my questions are all answered. So, um, to step in the right direction, I'm looking forward to um, your um, drafting another ordinance to um, to make it stick. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Javona. Councilor Camucci. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple of uh, follow ups. Um, some of the um, questions, comments that were raised by my colleagues. Um, uh, Councillor DeBono was just asking, you know, how many of these are in residential A? Um, that's the exact point of why I said I'm not comfortable voting um, for this tonight. And um, again, it's fine if my colleagues want to, but um, without knowing what impact we're going to have, I have a hard time potentially taking away someone's livelihood, even if it, they're in a residential A. Uh, district. I would like to know how many of those folks there are, what impact we're going to have. And I also just wanted to um, kind of make a couple of points of clarification. So there's 211 listings, active listings in Quincy. Only 130 of them are registered with the state, which means that only 130 of them are currently operating legally in Quincy. So I, I looked up just at, at Listening to my colleagues speak, um, Councillor Harris had mentioned um, Bellevue and Crabtree as being two locations that have been problematic in his ward. I, I ran the addresses through just Crabtree and Bellevue. There isn't a single red. There isn't a single short-term listing registered with the state on either of those streets. So what that means is they are operating illegally today, yesterday, and tomorrow. The city should be able to shut them down. This ordinance wouldn't give the city any more authority than it has today without the ordinance in terms of shutting down an illegal Airbnb. And in terms of the ones that are problematic, um, if they're not registered with the state, we can shut them down just like we could if this ordinance was passed and went into effect tomorrow. Um, In order for it to be legal, they have to register with the Department of uh, Revenue and they have to obtain a certificate of registration from the state with a certificate number that, that um, they have to present to both the short-term listing companies that they list with uh, and or municipal agencies 
uh, that are looking for. So we knock on the door and Jay Duca says, we think you're running a short-term listing. We'd like to see your certificate. Oh no, no, I'm not. And then you go on Airbnb or home away or whatever, you find that listing, you, you have proof that they're running an illegal short-term rental in the city of Quincy and you can shut them down. Um, as it relates to one of the questions that Councillor Liang was asking about when this would take effect, um, Mr. Durkin, we can, correct me if I'm wrong, but we can also set an enactment date. So we could take, we can add an amendment that says um, uh, this ordinance takes effect on, I don't know, you know three months from now, on, on March 15th, 2021, or, or six months from now, July 11th, 2021. We can set that if we, if we as a body think that we want to give folks uh, a running start to either change their business or get registered or whatever, we can set a further out date um, for this to be enacted. Even though we say we vote on it tonight, say the mayor signs it tomorrow, uh, it gets recorded with the city clerk. But uh, if it has an enactment date that's in the future, it doesn't become effective until that enactment date. So um, I just offer that up if that was kind of, it seemed like that's kind of what uh, Councillor Liang was thinking about is how do we give folks a little bit of breathing room between when we put this in place and when it would actually um, impact them. Uh, I think that's it. The, the only other thing I was going to say is that, um, you know, talking about them operating businesses in residential areas, um, it's, I, I agree with that to some, to some extent, but we also, uh, it's a policy of the city to not treat residential uh, leasing as a business. We treat it as a residence, which is why every uh, apartment building, no matter the size, you can have 400 units, you pay uh, the owner of that property who leases out those apartments, pays a residential tax rate, not a commercial tax rate, because the city does not recognize it as a business as we recognize other commercial enterprises. So um, I think there's a tax component with this as well that once we know who these who these properties are, um, where they are, that we'll be able to, um, our, the, the assessed value would impact the um, the value that they get from, from the short-term rental. Um, and th the other matter is, you know, there's 130 that registered now out of 211. Uh, the state's efforts were well publicized that they were that they were enacting a short-term residential a short-term uh short-term rental uh or uh legislation state law we are not going to enjoy that same amount of press coverage so I, I wouldn't think that anybody who isn't registering with the state and paying the appropriate taxes which you know the tax man is a lot more um uh punitive than mr duker is that's for sure uh, if they're not paying their taxes and registered with the state, they're not going to register with us. And so we'll be left in, and likely those are the problem properties that my colleagues are having troubles with. Right. Um, it's the ones who don't register that are, that are likely the biggest problem. And so I don't think this is going to necessarily change anything, uh, overnight because I think we're still going to have to track down those, um, wayward property owners that, um, aren't among the 130 that are registered with the state uh, because we, we don't even know where they are, right? Until, so we can find out where the 130 are. Uh, we can find out the actual addresses and see where they are on a zoning map. Um, but the difference, the what is it, 80 or so different? We don't know where those are. Uh, we don't know where they're specifically located. So we'll never be able to, to track those folks down until there's a problem. And then it's, you know, like whack-a-mole, which is what we do with with other um, uh, zoning code violations and building code violations. But I just wanted to throw that out there. I, I appreciate the concern that my colleagues have, and I certainly won't stand in the way of them taking um, action tonight to, to solve a, uh, an issue that's um, causing harm to the neighbors in the, neighbor, uh, in the neighborhoods. I, I get it. I, I have been fortunate that I haven't had many um, calls and emails about them in Ward 4. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm in a different position. I can, I feel as though I'm taking a little bit of a broader view on it to try and figure out the impact first, but um, I don't begrudge anyone um, 
you know, a, to vote yes on this tonight, but I, but I won't be, I, I want more information and, and I still want the information, even if we pass it, I still would like to, to have that information because I think it's always something if we need to change in the future, we can. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Durkin. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to Councilor Harris again. I don't think, I think this is your most recent text, Councilor Harris. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I, and I, I truly appreciate uh, what, um, what Council Palmucci is, is saying and everybody everybody's input. Um, I have a text right in front of me with three addresses on Dorchester Street. So anybody who knows Dorchester Street knows that um, that's right on the water overlooking Boston. So there's three that are not registered. Um, and we, you know, on Bellevue, I'm gonna just express, as I started saying earlier, um, I stood in front of the zoning board and, and what happened was with the zoning board, we brought one of the properties up on Bellevue um, that was advertising an Airbnb and and they weren't going to let us in. And the resistance, not resistance, but the, the fear of the city to, to knock on the door and say, hey, we're gonna walk in the door is, is was argued by uh, was argued by a lawyer uh, that I was standing up against, which I kind of felt really a little bit. I should have should have stayed in school a little longer, but I said that I it was unconstitutional in order to enter that building. So this is where where what we're trying to institute gives the city the opportunity to knock on that door and look at the advertisements and say, yes, you have three kitchens that weren't on the building permit in your place, in your in your establishment, and you don't even live there. So uh, the folks, everybody who's watching this from, from, uh, 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 from Squanum uh, and the folks, and this isn't just a res a uh, issue either folks, this is also, these issues are taking place in um, um, free families that are being rented out for, for a weekend uh, in North Quincy, uh, a floor that's being rented out for a weekend in North Quincy. Um, so uh, this isn't just a res a situation, it's also um, the other uh, B, uh, all, all the way, all the way through. So, um, again, um, I thank you for your time. I'm sorry, my passion for this tonight um, is 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 uh, is beyond beyond. So, thank you, everybody. I, I I'll try not to bother you again. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Um, I, again, I have just I'm going to go back. I, I'm sorry because this spurred a couple more questions, um, Solicitor Durkin, if you could. Um, so. If, when we do have the registration here in Quincy and Quincy has a registration, and if somebody was in violation and we issued the fine, what's the consequences of not paying the fine? Is there, is that something that would be a policy that's set up by the, um, just curious, so if so they're, they're, they're fined, what do we do when they don't, when they don't pay the fine? Um. Well, first of all, if they don't pay the fine and they and they don't rectify the situation that they've been fined for, yeah. uh, the amount of the civil fine is $100 per day. Okay. And that can be enforced in court. It can be enforced through an injunction in court. Um, and Jay Duca knows all of this. Yeah. I mean, he knows how he knows how to enforce these. The reason why I'm asking that is because the council from which you brought something up in the sense, and I was curious, the 180 that we have, and there's 211 that we know of, they're not registered. Um, I think what you said is that we could go in and shut them down, or what he said is we could go in and shut them down now. So is, is there a penalty for, an, oh, if they're in res, res A, they're not supposed to be there, first of all. But, but in other words, like if a house is um, shut down, but keeps renting or does not register, is there any additional things that we can do if, they, if, if they're acting as an Airbnb up and they shut them down, but they keep doing it? Is it just because they're not registered? What else is that we can do for the houses like that? I think that's kind of the, the from what I'm hearing from people, that seems to be the, um, the crutch that we're all trying to figure out. 
Yeah. If, uh, if, if an operator, if a property owner is in violation mm-hmm. of, of this ordinance and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, um, and the inspectional services, uh, even when they prevail upon them, they, they're still um, not doing what they're supposed to be doing on the, or, under the ordinance. The city can take them to court and they can, the city can file an injunction where a judge would order them to do what they're supposed to do and would order them to pay a fine. So if they're operating currently and they're not registered with the state, the city does have the authority to be able to take them to court potentially. If they were in violation causing problems, police would call regularly, they would be able to do that, correct? Yes. Okay. With or without this ordinance is, is kind of what Council Pomucci was suggesting. Yeah, Council um, Pomucci makes makes a good point. But the ones that the ones that aren't um, complying with state law, we don't know we don't know are. you know who they are. We don't yeah. we don't know who they are. No, I understand. I understand. But this will just actually, so it, it has two folds. I think the ordinance in, in the way I'm looking at it has, it has some benefits to the city of Quincy because we can now identify where they are. We know who they are and we can partner with the ones that are doing, doing well. And we can potentially make sure the ones that are not, that they're staying within the lines of the confinements of, of how we anticipate the businesses should be operated. And that could happen whether it's a, it's a, you know, it's a short-term rental, and that's the problem: is the short-term rentals that are getting out of hand. That we want to put our, kind of put our, as a city, put our abilities to be able to deal with that. And and I I, I do agree. One of the things I do agree with is that we're going to pass an ordinance. Um, if this ordinance is to be passed, that we should probably have some time for Mr. Duca to be able to create the policies that go around that. So maybe um, a friendly amendment might be too. And I, I'd like Council Liang to weigh in on this because it was around what she was suggesting. But maybe. You know, if, if this does pass, um, maybe it's something that we started. If, I'm not sure how long Jay Duca needs to be able to. Maybe this is something um, Mr. Walker could answer the amount of time that might be needed to draft the um, the procedures and protocols that go along with um, enforcing something like this. Through you, Madam President, or through you, Ma- Madam Chairwoman. Chairwoman. Um, I think a 30 to 60 day period mm-hmm. would sound reasonable, but we could make anything work uh, upon the council's approval. Okay. So um, I, I think maybe, it, I think it would be beneficial to the businesses that are out there. I, I'd like to make, make one suggestion. I do I do agree with Council Pomucci that it would be beneficial for us to know where the 180 are within the city of Quincy, uh, but we do have a motion to approve this in a second. I'm not sure if my fellow colleagues who put the motion in the second would, um, would care to withdraw that until we can get that information. I think we're all on the same page here. If not, we can move forward with the vote, but I would suggest that we put a friendly amendment that says that the um, the enactment date for um, for such ordinance might be um, you know, at, at least at least 30 days from the time this is signed to give some time for the city to be able to put some um, parameters around how the procedures will roll out and how you'll be able to communicate to the um, 180 that we do know of. So, Councilor Yang, did you like to weigh in on that? Because you were speaking in regards to um, the timing for being able to enforce something like that. Would you be interested in making a, a friendly amendment for that? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, if we are going to move forward on this tonight, I would like to make a friendly amendment. I appreciate Mr. Walker weighing in um, and saying anywhere between 30 and 60 days and providing the flexibility that, you know, the departments will work under whatever we um, we put through in this. But, you know, there's... Um, you know, no magic answer, I think here, right? But in just being thoughtful about the work that needs to happen in inspectional services for this on top of the work that they're already managing right now um, in conjunction with the health department and the work that's already happening in the health department in any sort of normal circumstance, I could see how 30 days could be feasible to get these departments to, to collaborate and put something together um, and to work with those uh, Airbnb owners to, to put something out. but. I think in these times, um, since they're not normal times, I, you know, would almost think that even anywhere up to, you know, 60 days, maybe like two months or so, like, I just, I want to be practical here, right? And just say that like four weeks goes by very quickly. And I just want to be respectful of the workload that these departments already have. And so, again, I, I, I got to be really honest with all of you. I don't, I don't have a magic number, you know, um, but I do certainly think that, that, you know, 30 days is, is pretty tight, um, you know. Uh, so those are my so, thoughts. 
So would you like to make a, I, I think, I think maybe pushing it up to, to um, enact the date being March 15th, 2021 um, would be about 60 days from, from today if we want to amend um, the ordinance to say the start date will be effective as of uh, March 15th, 2021, if you're amenable to that, Councilor Yang. Could we say that it can be uh, effective no later than? Yep. And that gives even more flexibility if, if it needs to, you know, if all of the work is done before then. Again, if they can do it in 30 days, phenomenal, you know. Um, so if we could just change that to say no later than instead of on that date, it gives them, I would hope, um, as much flexibility as they need for that. Okay. If, if I could just, if I could just interject here. I think it would be important for the council to put a definite date when this ordinance would become effective. So I, I don't think you, you could put no later than it, it, it. There should be a definite, a date certain. Okay, that's fine. So we'll that, change it to So on. that it's enforceable as of a certain date. Okay, so I'll make a motion to make an amendment um, to have it start on March 15th, 2021. Okay. Thank you both. So we have a motion on the table to whoa, amend whoa, whoa, whoa. our date from two March fifteenth. Do we have a second for that? Can I get a point of order? Yep. Yes, Mr. So McCarthy. There was there was a motion on the table first to approve the amendments. Yep. And we never did anything with that. We have a second. And now now we got another motion that's going ahead of that. I'm just trying to figure out who's on first here. Okay. So we have a motion to accept. By Mr. McCarthy, seconded by Mr. Harrison. We had points points on the motion for that. So, did, yep. Did, did, now, did, my my point of order is just I heard a lot of talk about withdrawing the motion, yeah. and then I heard the um, council president's comments, which I agree on giving sixty days or a number. Um, so do you want me to withdraw that motion, you know, because that's on the table first? If we could, Point of parliamentary would... procedure, if I yeah. may. Sure, if, if, if Mr. McCarthy is in agreement with uh, Ms. Liang and Ms. Mahoney's amendment, he can simply say, I move approval as amended. And that will cover everything, including Mr. Durkin's amendments, which we all are aware of and received, as well as Ms. Liang's. Yep. So I approve as amended. Thank you. And now on the motion to approve the ordinance that has been made by Mr. McCarthy, seconded by Ms. Councilor, Har Councilor Harris, what I was suggesting is Council Pamucci has asked for more information that he would like to have. I think we're all in agreement where we're at right now, but Council Pamucci has asked for information I think that the rest of the council might might benefit from is to find out where those 180 are located within the different wards by address to see how many are in res A. Would we consider getting that information before we go ahead with the vote tonight? And if that's the case, I would have to ask for a motion to remove. And I would suggest um, accepting the amendments first. Yeah. And then okay. we have to get so, that motion out of the way first. Okay, so why don't we- We're not approving it yet. We're just accepting the right. amendment. So why don't, so, so we're at a roll, so if we can accept all of the changes in the um, the ordinance, do we have a motion to accept all of the changes in the ordinance? So moved. So moved. Second and by. Second. Okay. Do we have? We don't have to have a roll call on that, do we, Jen? Yes. We do. Okay. So Jen, could you do a roll call? Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Yes. Councilor Debona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Council Liang? Yes. Oh, is my microphone on? Yes. Council yes. McCarthy? Yes. Council Palmucci? Yes. Council Phelan? Yes. Chairman Mahoney? Yes. All the amendments are accepted. Okay. So, with all the amendments accepted, okay, Council Palmucci. <laughs> I, I, thank you. I, I And I appreciate you um, um, looking out for, for my concerns um, about having more questions. Uh, I, I was going to simply suggest that we do what we did recently, which uh, I, I thought was kind of a good idea is we're in committee. So if we approve this out of committee, we're simply sending it to the full council. If we refrain from um, pulling it out of committee at the full council tonight and perhaps do it at a, uh, we have a council meeting next week and then two weeks after that, um, we can move this forward so that there's still some momentum to it. We approve it in 
um, committee tonight, and then uh, we don't bring it out of committee until we have those answers and we're we're ready to vote on it. That would be my suggestion, but I just throwing that out there. Okay, so you're so you're okay with us moving this forward and getting the information for you and discussing it before you take the final vote, correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. Madam Chair, Madam Chair. Yep. Can Council we make Harris. sure that this does not go past two meetings? Is that something we can put into a, a you know, a, 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 let's let's not have things in committee and and not get voted on. This is this is too important. Uh, That's fine. Okay. Uh, Council Harris, I'm not trying to hold this up. I was just trying to get, I was trying to be- I, I didn't say you were, Ms., uh, Madam Chair. That's the second time I've had a meeting that you suggested I was. So we will certainly I didn't be bringing this up. Madam Chair, I just want it to be two meetings. That's all I said. Yep. So there is a motion. So so I think what we're saying is that this is going to be taken out of committee site and brought to um, to the full vote when we have the um, the information potentially at the next meeting. And if at the next meeting we can also, we can vote on, is that what you're saying, Council Pamuchi? Yeah, okay. So we'll we'll vote on it at the next meeting. Council yes, and we can we can take a vote in committee no. for a positive recommendation to the full council and then just not vote mm -hmm. as, as a full council. So we can finish our committee work tonight um, upon mm -hmm. a motion and, and I'll move positive recommendation to the full council of the ordinance as amended. Um, and then if it passes, it's favorably recommended out of committee um, and then we'll just wait, you know, one or two meetings um, until we get the information to pull it out on the full council. Okay, so we had a motion to approve. Which we had a motion to approve the amendment. Now amendment. we need a motion to approve. Now we need a uh, to, for favorable recommendation okay. to the convention. Yep. So do we have a motion to approve favorable recommendation? Make a motion. So. Councilor Phelan, second by Pamucci. Councilor Pamucci, and. So now do we need a roll call, Jen? Yep, so we have a roll call. All right, Councilor Kane. Yes. Council Kroll. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. Council Fagan. Yes. Chairman Mahoney. Yes. Passes nine to zero, positive recommendation. There are several more though that. Yep, so this ordinance um, passes the first, so we're moving on to 2020-126. Um, it's the order to accept the, the local excise tax provision of the Mass General Law, Chapter 64, Room Occupancy um, Excise. Um, Mr. Durkin, would you like to to, um, to speak on this? I, I move approval. I move positive approve? recommendation to the council. Positive recommendation to the council, second by. Second. Hi, um, Councilor Phelan. Um, Jen, could you do a roll call for that? Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. Chairman Mahoney. Yes. 2020-127 order accepting the community impact fee provision of Mass General Law Chapter 64G Room Occupancy Excise Professionally Managed Units. Move positive recommendation to the full council. By pa Council Palmucci moves positive recommendation. Second by? Uh, second. Uh, Councilor Harris. Um, Jen P. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. Chairman Mahoney. Yes. Nine members. Right. And then finally, um, ordinance number 2020-128, order accepting the community impact fee provision mass general law chapter 64G room, room occupancy excise two family or three family dwellings. Move positive recommendation to the council. So Moved by Council Pompucci, seconded by Councilor Harris and Ms. Manning. Council Kane. Yes. Council Kroll. Yes. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Pamucci. Yes. Council Phelan. Yes. Chairman Mahoney. Yes. Nine members, positive recommendation. All right. So. That concludes the items that are in the ordinance meeting. So I have a motion. It is um, 
839, a motion to um, to close the ordinance meeting and move back into um, regular session. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so we're gonna dive right into the agenda here. Uh, Madam Clerk, first item on the agenda, please. Number one, 2021 nomination and election of president of the city council. Nominations are now open. Thank you, Councilor Pramanchi. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, it is my pleasure to nominate Councilor at large Nina Liang to serve as city council president for the remainder of the session. Um, she has served with distinction for the last year and I believe um, has really shown her willingness uh, and encouragement for the body to work cooperatively. Um, her, uh, her cooperation has been infectious, I would say. Uh, with this group can be uh, a Herculean task at times to get us to work cooperatively. But uh, I believe that uh, Council President Liang offers a unique perspective and viewpoint um, that's been uh, invaluable to this body and certainly to me personally uh, in her approach to issues and um, thought process and way she approaches this job. Um, I have found to be um, inspiring at times. Um, and this has been one of the most tumultuous years uh, that anyone's ever seen. Uh, and she's led our council well through this um, times, these uncertain times. So it's with great optimism, looking forward to a better year in 2021, that I nominate Nina Liang to serve a second term as our city council president. Second. Thank you, Thank you. Council Palmucci. We have um, a motion made for Council Liang as um, council president and seconded by Councilor Kane. Any other nominations? Move to close nominations. Motion, yeah, move to close. Okay, uh, I will now take the vote and please, if you would say um, Councilor Nina Liang's name. I don't think we have to do that oh. anymore. Oh, Didn't we change right. that weird You're rule? right. It, yes. You're so absolutely right. We can just right. say yes. Rather You're absolutely awkwardly. right. Please Repeat excuse her name me. nine times. Yeah. Please excuse me. You are absolutely right. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Nine members. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, if I could just just quickly grab everyone's time, um, I will, I'll be quick. I just want to, first of all, thank Councilor Pramucci um, for changing that so that I didn't have to hear my name go around <laughs> a bunch of times. Um, you know, as all of you know from working with me, that makes me extremely uncomfortable. So I'm really grateful for that. But truly, um, Councilor Pramucci, thank you so much for your kind words um, and for your, your nomination tonight. And to my colleague uh, in Ward 3, Councilor Kane, thank you so much for our partnership over the years and for seconding uh, my nomination for a second year to all of my colleagues thank you so much for an incredible year an amazing year it's definitely been a challenging one and not one that i think um, any of us could have ever anticipated when we started off a year ago um, but i will say a heartfelt thank you to each of you for staying focused and on tasks and things that are important to you um, last year at this time you know i was super proud to stand up and accept you know representing this council because of the diversity of experience um, and background, and more importantly than that, um, passion to serve your constituents. And I have seen all of you fight uh, to continue to serve your constituent on issues that are important to you and that you are committed to in your jobs. And it has been an absolute honor to be a supportive role in that way as much as possible in all the calls I've had with you on um, issues that you've brought up to all of us as a body, issues that you've worked on, um, and ordinances that you've worked on, resolves that you've worked on. And so to be able to uh, lead that effort and to help collaborate um, anything that needs to get done to move that has really been an honor. I love doing the work. Um, it is absolutely um, something that I take pride in. And with everything that's going on in the world these days, particularly last week, you know, it really does bring me so much hope to be able to come back into this space and work with all of you. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart and to everyone in the clerk's office, to Nikki, to Sue, to Kathy, and to everyone really, and specifically to Jen. I don't think any of this would have been possible without you. So thank you so much for getting all of us through this last year. Um, and with that, Madam Clerk, next item on the agenda, please. Number two, COVID-19 update, Health Commissioner Ruth Jones. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner. Good evening. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, Councilors. 
I'm here tonight to give an update on COVID-19. Um, as you all know, um, the city of Quincy, uh, like every other city in Massachusetts, has been experiencing a surge of cases. Um, and as of uh, closing numbers tonight, we have, since the beginning of COVID-19, had 5,292 cases total. We've had um, almost 3,800 um, of those cases recover. We um, have had 141 deaths. Um, we are um, not experiencing, thank goodness, a lot of uh, people dying right now. Most of those 141 deaths were in the beginning of COVID um, and uh, were for the most part, the majority of those were nursing home um, patients uh, when COVID first began. Right now in Quincy, we have uh, 1,323 active cases and we're experiencing about an average of 60 to 65 cases a day right now. Uh, to compare that back to the beginning of COVID in the first surge of uh, COVID, um, we, had, we were getting about 40, 45 cases a day. Um, we are now up to 60, 65. We have obviously had dips in between that when the curve um, did go down originally. Uh, we were down to maybe five or six cases a day. And then um, as we saw cases go up all over the United States, um, we experienced uh, the surge in this. We are still in this second surge. And as you know, if you've seen any of the uh, uh, stories on the news, we were uh, in a surge to begin with, and then we hit the holidays. So there was a bit of a Thanksgiving, uh, post Thanksgiving day surge. We also had a post Christmas New Year surge, which is what we're still experiencing now. And so in, in, um, in both of those areas, we saw an elevation of cases. Um, we are still seeing the brunt of our cases in 20 to 40 year olds. Um, and again, just to compare that back to the beginning of COVID-19, the cases were um, traditionally in older, um, older folks, uh, 60s and 70s. Um, but we are still seeing that 20 to 40 year old as the majority of our cases. We have seen, uh, particularly with the holiday surges, we have seen an increase in uh, cases age 18 and under. Um, but I am happy to say that we have not seen an increase in transmission within the school system. Um, what we're seeing, and in, in not just for kids, but for um, all the cases, we're seeing, as, it, seeing it as community, um, uh, passed, passed in the community, households where we're getting four or five, six people in the same household uh, testing positive, mom and dad test positive, then all the kids test positive or vice versa. Um, and we've seen that kind of trend for a long time. Um, and we're really matching up with other cities and towns uh, that surround us with, that are having the same types of um, instances of um, total families testing positive. Um, we, we do see clusters of cases um, in Quincy, some in businesses, um, and um, we do see clusters after certain gatherings. Again, the holidays um, had shown us that. Um, but I, you know, we're, we're doing an enormous amount of testing. And again, thanks to Manit, who I did watch um, the presentation and very well deserved. I, I, I have to say with Manit, um, I have never called Manit and asked for something where they've said no. Um, they have stepped up to the plate every time for us with testing and now are stepping up to the plate with vaccination. Um, and they are a, a really a, such an important partner uh, to the health department and to the city of Quincy. Uh, we are currently in red. We have been in red for a while now. Um, our positivity rate um, as of last week was 8%. Um, two weeks prior to that, um, the positivity rate was down closer to 6 and 7%. Um, the state department of public health um, uh, publishes numbers um, and the, the numbers are published on a weekly basis, but they reflect the two prior weeks. And on January 5th, which was when they published the last um, numbers for um, all the cities and towns, um, Quincy had um, a positivity rate of 8%. 
Uh, we had um, in the last 14 days prior to January 5th, there were almost 11,000 tests um, on Quincy residents and 880 that were positive. And, and that's how they figure out the positivity rate. Um, we uh, continue to do contact tracing um, and case investigation. And we are utilizing now because of the caseload, um, the um, State Department of Public Health contact tracers, um, which um, we can refer cases to them um, and have them do the contact tracing. And we have contact with them uh, throughout, um, throughout all the cases. And that's where we're at up to this point. Um, just to give you an idea of surrounding cities and towns, um, Weymouth has a positivity rate of 11, almost 11.7. Um, and Braintree uh, has a positivity rate of 7.71. So we're right in the middle of that. Um, and obviously we're, we're larger than Braintree. Um, so I think, um, you know, we are holding our own, um, but we are definitely um, still, um, we are definitely still dealing with the surge in cases. Thank you so much, Commissioner. I'm gonna open it up to my colleagues um, if they have any questions for you. So just give me one moment to take a look around. Okay, I don't see any, oh, sorry, Councillor DeBona. Thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you, Ruth, for all your hard work. Um, just real quick on the um, the vaccinations. Um, do you, I know the studies are not really all fully there, um, what what are the repercussions for um, uh, the long term effects of, of the vaccine? So, I only ask that question because is there a, is it, actually two questions? Is there a possibility that the COVID nineteen just dips and goes? Okay, we're it's gone. Is, it, is that a possibility? Kind of like the Spanish flu, where just it just ends. It, it's it's out. It's gone. Without vaccination, you mean? Without vaccination, it's just somehow or another. It just says okay. We've, we've done our time, it's warming up all over the world, boom, it's gone. You know, from what I've seen and what I've um, what I've read about it, I, I don't think that's gonna occur. Um, I would not be surprised if COVID um, comes back every year like the flu, and it might be something down the road that it might be a yearly vaccine or um, maybe at some point, you know, there was talk and this, this is just, um, you know, nothing that scientifically um, they put together yet, but talk of it being, um, you know, there may be one shot that includes uh, the flu influenza for that season and COVID-19. Um, so I don't think without vaccination, this is going to go away. Um, I think vaccination is a really important part of it. I understand, you know, the different um, views on vaccinations um, and um, the different views on COVID-19. Um, I don't know the long-term effects because obviously we don't have any long-term data um, that um, really supports um, anything. And, and, and as you know, the, the vaccines are being used um, under an emergency authorization use. However, um, I feel confident that the vaccines are safe. Um, I feel confident that um, from what I have read so far, that the vaccines um, will um, take care of the, the, um, the strain of COVID-19 that we have. And according to um, what the scientists are saying, that um, it takes a while before a, a, a strain mutates to the point that the vaccine wouldn't cover it. But I think there's so much more um, that we have to know about this and so much more that has to be um, really scientifically proven about this. I think the vaccine right now is, is our best shot at getting even close to getting back to normal. Um, and, you know, I, th I think um, some of the hesitation that people have for vaccination is um, some of the side effects that were originally seen with um, the first uh, doses of vaccine, Pfizer vaccine um, with uh, hospital workers. Um, and the, if you look at the amount of vaccines that were, have been given and the amount of um, anaphylactic or allergic reactions that people have had, 
um, the number is really very small. Um, anybody can have an allergic reaction to a, any type of vaccine, to any type of medicine. Um, but I think um, that people need to understand this is an important vaccine. Um, when my turn comes up to get it, I will get vaccinated. Um, and I think it's important that people um, you know, do what they feel they have to do. But I think vaccination is, is really one of the most important um, aspects of this to get us out of this, um, uh, you know, this pandemic. So you foresee it very similar to the flu shot where kind of yearly basis type of COVID-19 I, I COVID think, shot? Yeah, I think it may be something like that. I think we have to really, um, you know, get more information on it. Um, I know that, you know, this vaccine, you get one shot with, with the ones that we have right now, and you, ha you have to have a second shot um, to build up a full immunity. I don't know if that's something that's going to be consistent down the road, that you may need two shots um, all the time. This is something, again, we don't have all the information on this. It's, it's, we don't have all the information on the pandemic itself, on COVID-19. We're still learning as we go along. I think it's, it's our best bet. Um, to get some sort of normalcy back, to get some sort of herd immunity. Um, and I, you know, people need to know it's right now, you know, when you do go get your vaccine, it's not just like getting a flu shot and, and going right back to work. Um, the vaccine, because it's new, there are extra precautions um, because there were some anaphylactic reactions, um, you know, with uh, first responders when they were getting it in New York and, um, and in the hospitals. Um, the precautions are a little bit more um, stringent with this. So you end up staying there a little bit longer. The vaccination process um, has been slow to begin with because of um, distribution of the vaccine. Um, but the, the process itself is a little bit different from a, a flu shot. With a flu shot, you can get your flu shot and you go and you're on your way. With this type of vaccination, you really need to sit for about 15 to, to 30 minutes, depending on your history. Um, and to make sure that you don't have any reaction. So the vaccines are, you know, they're, they're being done. Um, it's a little bit slower process. I think as time goes on and we get um, more um, astute at doing this, um, it will be a little bit easier. It'll be a little bit quicker. And hopefully, um, you know, the vaccines will roll out a little quicker from the state. Thank you. I just, I'll be honest with you. I just want to go back to normal life. And I don't know if there's any normal do. <laughs> we all do. I'm willing, I to take, I'm willing to do the shot and, you know, and if it has to be some type of yearly routine, like a flu shot, um, do you foresee it being an immunization for children? Kind of like the oh, chicken yeah. pox and the um, measles yeah. and the mumps. Right now it's not indicated for kids, but they're doing yeah. lots of um, research on that. And I, um, you know, I, I think like any other, um, any other vaccine, kids are not just little adults. And so we have to look, you know, they, the scientists have to look at all the ramifications that would happen. I do foresee down the road, I don't know what time period would that would be, um, but they're just doing some amazing things with these vaccines. Um, and so I, I would hope to see it in the future for kids. Thank you so much, Ruth. And I appreciate all your hard work. And um, I know it's, it's been a busy 2020 and hopefully we have a better 2021. <laughs> hopefully. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Do any other councillors have any other questions for the commissioner? Okay, uh, Commissioner, I just have one. Um, could you? Oh, sorry, Council Mahoney. Did I see you put your hand up? I did. I did. You did. Okay. I had Go a ahead. Quick question, um, Ruth. First, I want to thank you for all your incredibly hard work and everybody who works for you that's doing this. This is a it's a it's a difficult job, um, and I know like this is with the surge right now. And the governor has come in for travel restrictions. Could you just um, uh, it? So many people ask me these questions, and, it, and, and mostly because of um, recent recent things that have happened in the news, obviously. But could you just refresh people's memory as to what the restrictions are, what you're supposed to do in the state of Massachusetts, and also just for people in Quincy to know um, for travel and both to whether you're coming from out of state into Quincy or if you're leaving Quincy to go to another state. Sure. So the travel restrictions. Um, say that you need to test um, and test negative um, 72 hours before you come into Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And um, you need to, and there are different states have different restrictions of mm -hmm. what you need to have before you go into those states. But Massachusetts um, says you have to have a test, a negative test 
72, at least 72 hours, no longer than that, um, before you come back into Massachusetts. Um, if you do not, then you have to quarantine. And mm -hmm. if you quarantine, um, you can quarantine for 14 days and not get tested, stay quarantined. And after that 14 days, um, provided that you do, do not develop any symptoms, um, then you're free to go on day 15. Um, you can come if it. some people find it difficult to get a shot, um, you know, 72 hours or, or sooner before you travel because you may be traveling that length of time. So if you um, can't get, um, I'm sorry, not a shot, a test. If you can't get yeah. I'm not saying a shot, no, uh, it's to <laughs> get a test. I know, I know. Um, but if you get, if you can't get the test and you come back into Massachusetts, again, you have to quarantine right away. You can obtain a test in Massachusetts, so you can break your quarantine to go get tested. And if you test negative, once you test negative, then you you are out of quarantine. So there's okay. different ways of doing it: either test before you come into Massachusetts, or if you cannot do that, test once you're back into Massachusetts quarantine until you get your negative test result and then you're good to go. And there are certain um, um, uh, indications if you have children that are under a certain age, um, if those children are traveling with parents, they don't necessarily um, have to test when they come back. Um, they don't necessarily have to quarantine. I advise people to go on to um, mass.gov um, travel slash travel and everything is listed out there. The exemptions are listed there because there are a whole bunch of exemptions on that page for people who work or go to school in other states. So I would suggest that people look on that page before they uh, do travel. There's also a travel form that has to be filled out that's supposed to be filled out. Um, so we just advise people to go on there and look. Look to see where you're traveling to, what their restrictions are, and what you have to do before you come back into Massachusetts. But, but in all honesty, and I, I, I encourage people because this is this is where we're getting into trouble because people think because they're traveling and they they have a bubble here and they're traveling to somebody else and they think they're in a bubble, but we it, it, you're not because you're not safe from that bubble. You're, you might be safe from the bubble you have here, but you're not safe from necessarily where you're going. But mm -hmm. um, you know, it's also kind of on the honor system. You get the test, and hopefully nobody's bringing it back. But we do trust that people are doing that. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it is one of the things that we just have to really remind people that you're, you know, you're, you're um, disenfranchising the rest of us by not following those rules. And if we all follow the rules just for a little bit longer and get vaccinated, um, hopefully um, we will be back to normal. It, it's been a long time. We all want normal. It's still shocking to me, but it's it's you know for us to get there, we all have to play by the same rules. <laughs> Absolutely, I think nobody expected things to go this long, and no. I think it's very difficult for people to follow all these restrictions and and the changes in the restrictions and and now the you know the the different vaccines and do I get it? Do I don't get it? I think it's very difficult. There are hard decisions to make, but I agree with you. If you can last just a little bit longer, I think we're getting to the point where hopefully there'll, there'll be some light at the end of the tunnel. Better days are coming. Yes. And my last question to you is, um, in the strains that we're seeing um, here in Quincy, um, and it's amazing to me, the numbers that you just referenced, are we seeing the new strain of COVID or is it still the old strain of COVID? So that's a really good question. And we don't get to see the strain um, at the health department. Um, we that's get- That's unfair. <laughs> huh? That seems unfair. <laughs> it is unfair. I agree with you. We get to we get a result. We don't even see the lab result. We get a result over our system, our state system, mm -hmm. uh, which does not give us the strain. However, um, my my personal feeling is that we um, that the strain, that second strain um, yeah. that was so public, is probably most places. Um, yeah, I, and if it's not here yet. It will be. Um, yeah. Um, so I, you know, I couldn't give you numbers on that um, and, and specifics on that because we don't get to see that information. Yeah, it's. I was just curious because I, I you know, they they basically will tell us like if it's in Massachusetts, and from what I understand, that strain is harsher than, believe it or not, the first one. But I think it all depends on who the person who that gets it. But the most important thing is going back to that restricting yourself just a little bit longer. It's hard. Nobody's, you know, it's in, in, you know, even when we do get through all this, I'm not sure what the new normal will be, but 
Um, but we, if we all work together and, and just hold out just a little bit longer, we should, you know, we should be seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, like you said. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other councillors have any questions for the Commissioner? Okay, Commissioner, uh, the question that I had was just if you can just give a brief update on um, who in the city, what departments have gotten vaccinated and what the sort of rollout plan is that we should anticipate in the city. Sure, so right now, um, because um, there was a slow rollout of vaccine um, from the state to the local um, boards of health, um, we are in the first phase, there are three different phases um, to uh, vaccine administration. We are in phase one. Phase one started off with um, ho uh, hospital workers, um, healthcare people who are on the front line uh, with um, COVID-19. Um, so those that was the uh, mostly the Pfizer, um, the first doses of Pfizer that went directly to hospitals who had the proper refrigeration, uh, were able to store it correctly. Um, and then the uh, Moderna, um, was um, was approved in Moderna was the second vaccine um, that was um, that came out to the to the state Department of Public Health um, that is now being used at this point to do um, first responders so right now in Quincy um, and again thanks to Manit Health um, they are being vaccinated our first responders are in the process of being vaccinated so this will be. Um, this will be our fire, our police, our EMS, um, and we will proceed to the different phases as vaccine um, distribution allows. So as as uh, the quantities increase that we're getting, um, then we'll be able to do more people. Um, the phases, by the way, are all on mass.gov. If anybody's interested in looking specifically, there are three phases, and in the phases, it trickles down um, to um, to uh, different categories in that particular phase. So the next um, part of phase one will be um, healthcare workers who are not on um, frontline COVID care. Um, and that would be some home health workers. Um, it will may include um, dentists, uh, doctors um, who aren't working in hospitals if they haven't been vaccinated. Um, and then we, um, we move down to phase two Phase two will be um, certain age groups. Um, they just now included, um, the State Department of Public Health just included 75, age 75 plus as part of phase two. Um, that would also include, um, as we talk about city departments, um, public health, um, it would include um, public works. Um, um, it would also include teachers um, and so Again, that phase, that second phase goes down in different priority levels. And then um, it would also include people age um, 65 um, and older with one or two comorbidities. Um, so say someone who's you know, 67, 68, uh, has diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, things like that. Um, and then the third phase is the general public. And so that's anybody who didn't fit into that first phase or maybe fit into that first phase and just didn't decide to get it during those phases, um, we'll be able to get it um, in that third phase. Um, the second phase is set to go um, from um, February to April, but those times are just kind of a, an estimate and it will all depend on the amount of vaccine um, that's actually distributed to local, uh, local health departments. Great. Thank you so much. I know that there are some questions um, that folks are asking about, you know, the rollout of that. And, you know, it sounds like we're following the state guidelines on it. And it's helpful to see specifically which departments in the city are being impacted by those guidelines. So I do appreciate it. Sure. Um, Commissioner, I think, uh, again, with no other questions or inquiries by my colleagues, um, I think you're all set. So thank you so much for your update. I appreciate it. Thank you so much and stay safe. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. Madam Clerk, next item on the agenda, please. Oh, Madam Clerk, I'm just going to unmute you one moment. Sorry. 2021-002, an adoption of the 2021 City Council meeting schedule. 
Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Thank you. Do we have a second? Oh, it's seconded by Councillor Jabona. Are there any questions on this council calendar? Councillor Jabona? Yes, uh, yes, Madam President. Um, just real quick, um, Clerk Crispo, um, do we have the dates for the uh, uh, election this year? Um, do, do you have the um, election I calendar? Not, um, I do not have um, the election calendar done yet. Um, it has okay. to it will be looked at by the state later on in the week. And okay. once that's approved, it'll come back before you. Um, I did speak with the clerk of committees and um, we may have to adjust um, a date in September. Okay. And as soon as we know that, I will of course get it to the council president and get it out to all of you. Yeah, I was just looking at it right now in September and um, the Jewish holidays in there as well and trying to make sure that we're it always becomes an issue in september so um yep great yeah so if we have to move it around you know we, we can move it around because we right now september 13th september 20th the back-to-back -back weeks after labor day labor day weekend right labor we may have to go the 20th and 27th we're okay looking at that but um we wanted to get out as much as we could now okay. and then if we have to amend it um you know, a little later on, we will. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none. So we have a motion to approve by Council McCarthy, seconded by Councilor Jabona. Madam Clerk, could you read the roll, please? Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Yes. Councilor Dabona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Nine members have passed. Thank you. Number Next four. item on the agenda, please. Thank you. Number four, 2021-003, order acceptance mass general law section 10 and 15 of chapter 218 of the acts of 2018, the Brave Act, providing tax benefits. Waive the reading. Move approval. Okay, we're gonna cancel the council to waive the reading. Um, motion, motion to approve, seconded by Council McCarthy. Um, Mr. Walker, I believe that you wanted to uh, speak a little bit on this before we move to, is, is there anything you wanted to comment on this? No comment through you, Madam President, but if the council wanted a brief overview, I think it was fairly self-explanatory. I could certainly get into it a little bit. Um, it, you know what, let me just see if any of my colleagues have any questions first, and if they do, they can defer them to you, if that's all right with you. Excellent, do any of my colleagues have any questions on this item? Uh, Councilor Devona, I see you raising I your hand. I don't have any questions, I just have a couple comments. Um, sure. Um, just, just like to thank the mayor and the administration for bringing this brave act to Quincy, Massachusetts. Um, Governor Baker signed us into enactment, and it was a bipartisan legislation. Both parties working together to help out veterans, active duty soldiers, and their families. It's going to help out with the tax exemptions, paid military leave, burial expenses, and rights. So, I just overall thank you, um, Mayor Koch, and uh, the administration for bringing this forward to Quincy. Happy to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, does anybody else have any other questions or comments on, on this item? Okay, seeing them. Madam Clerk, could you call the roll, please? Councillor Kane. Yes. Councillor Kroll. Yes. Councillor DeBona. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. Council Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Nine members. Yeah. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, please. Number five, 2021-004, resolve for the city council support waive, for funding waive, waive. Ferry access. Motion to waive the reading by Councillor Harris. Councillor Harris. Yes, thank you. Um, um, I, first, I want to thank um, Council Pomucci, who actually helped me very much with this uh, this resolution and this resolution has changed over the uh, things of things are changing. We're not sure whether how much they're changing, but first of all, um, tomorrow night is uh, um, the mayor of Boston. Uh, the present mayor of Boston is going to give the uh, state of the city of Boston. It was three years ago. He announced the building of the Long Island Bridge. 
But at this time, I want to thank my colleagues and my former colleagues who supported the fact that we stood up and that we said no to our neighbor to the north. And it wasn't that we were saying no to the neighbor of the north because of, of, of what the idea was that was going to go there out on Long Island, but it was how things to get to Long Island. And but um, I want to first um, say congratulations to the mayor of Boston, who uh, will be the Secretary of Labor, and that's going to be a really really great opportunity for for the mayor of Boston and not only important to the country. So he's got some really big, big things that he has to do. But moving forward to what this resolution says, and, and it's pretty clear, and it says that this, we were, we're asking that the city of Quincy hereby declares a willingness to help fund ferry access to Long Island in an effort to open recovery as soon as possible. Anybody who knows what's going on, what, what, what sees between, we talked, we've heard about Father Bills earlier this evening and the work that Manon has done with their outreach programs and, and everything that they do. Um, there are a lot of things that go on that that are gonna go on out and, and could go on, could go out on Long Island, but I think that first and foremost, as there are people going to be lining up, I think it's going to be one of those uh, election years next year um, in Boston that uh, I really, you know, don't really care about the election year <laughs> next year in Boston, but I do care about wh what what steps they're going to take going forward. Um, and, and there are a lot of different different ideas that, that need to happen, but I know those buildings in that area, in the area, they totally hope uh, that is involved in where the old recovery center was. They need, they actually need so much work. Um, uh, I think everything was stripped uh, from copper to everything before it left. I could be wrong. It's only rhetoric because I've not been out there. But I myself feel that 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 island should become a national parkland. And just like the other islands. And that section, though, still could be um, sectioned off for um, a recovery center uh, to help alleviate the, the region's problems, the, the folks that, that, that need the help. And I don't want to forget about either who uh, the folks that appeared in front of us as a council, the uh, our Native American friends who, who uh, let's not let another, as we talk about this, let's not let another travesty takes place like took place at Dare Island. Um, many years ago during the big dig where uh, remains were moved and actually some of them are uh, supposedly in uh, in Quincy that have been uh, left left and 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 that's just wrong it would be wrong if it happened to any of our families or any anybody's families anybody's nationality um, so my friends of that I'm talking to my my friends, the native um, uh, Native uh, Americans. Um, I'm still with you. They should be an archae uh, uh, archaeologic. Um, I'm saying it uh, archaeologic um, survey done. But I do believe that the only thing that really should be taking place, and immediately because it's gone too long, three years, as I just mentioned previously. Three years has been too long before anything has been done. We stood up, we said no, 
and we look like the bad guys, but we aren't the bad guys. This resolution says that we are willing to ask the mayor, because he's the person who would, would approve any funding and then bring it to us um, to help with the ferry system, which actually, if it's worked right, could could help everybody, you know? And um, I think that the ferry system is the right way. I think it really should be a national parkland. I really think that we have to be concerned with 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 some of the things out, out there, but the wrong thing was the fact to rebuild a bridge that, you know, that just didn't make, it doesn't make sense. And um, all I could say is tomorrow the mayor of Boston does give his uh, his uh, state of the city address. I hope he, I, I wish him all the best. Um, I hope that the people that are, uh, are going to follow him uh, rethink their direction. But with with our help, I think we should be so much involved and more involved in use our influence as a council with every single person that has every philanthropist that we've 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 we've, we've met to help fight this horrible uh uh opioid problem that we that our nation is fi- uh, our nation it's been put in the background it's been put in the back back burner since the the covid and um so all i can say is that i want to thank my counselors for supporting we stood up and it's it's not even even close to being able uh to be built but um but you know again um i believe that at one point we really need to really step up our our game when it comes to uh fighting the opioid problem and again especially uh especially as 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 hopefully uh, all the vaccines come through and and we have this problem in our rearview mirror and uh, we um, we can actually help uh, you know uh, do more and I, I appreciate your time and again um, thank you madam president thank you counselor did you want to make a motion on that oh absolutely motion to approve Thank you. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Okay, seconded by Councilor Jabona. I do have some folks that have some questions on it. Councilor Mahoney will go to you first, and then Councilor Pamunchi. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, Councilors, for bringing this forward. I do have a couple of questions because as it reads right now, it says the City of Quincy would declare its willingness to help fund a ferry access to Long Island. Where are we funding this access to and for the ferry? Where would it would become from Marina? from Marina Bay or is it coming from Boston? I'm confused as to what we're funding. So or what we're establishing the the willingness to fund. Well, uh, well, uh, obviously, um, uh, obviously we've, we've had a ferry system in, uh, in place uh, down um, in, in out of uh, Swanna Point Park, which really hasn't uh, panned out. And we have all sorts of uh, uh, ferries that are, are not are not running right now with the MBTA. It's a matter of just I think working with 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 not only the st- uh, state state um, legislature, um, uh, of course the governor, um, and and try to find a, a way to utilize uh, actually utilize from UMass Boston. Um, they have a, a, a pier that is not in disrepair. We have a pier in Swan Point Park that needs repair, that needs needs work. It's aged. Um, we really need to, at one point, at one point too, I mean, it could be a win-win if we could get a system going on um, where we have, uh, we, we kind of combine some type of transportation system that um, our ferry system is is in place and uh, uh, again ferry ferries have been the the most um, economical the right thing to do 
ecological, uh, ecologically the right thing to do. So, um, you know, as far as as far as going out of Moon Island, uh, Moon Island, um, Moon Island, um, uh, I've been questioned about that, and I, I absolutely would not not even think about a you know a pier being built on 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 Moon Island because it would defeat the purpose of not having a bridge, um, especially the fact that we should probably be looking at Moon Island with some of the things that go on out there. Um, so, Council Mahoney, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the question. Uh, where would it come? Where would it come from? I would I would just say that there's plenty of plenty of peers in, in Boston. They go out to uh, they go out to spectacle. Uh, I believe it's Spectacle Island. There's actually an Indian uh, preserve out there. Not only can you go out there, you can go out there on a boat, and you can also um, have dinner. You can have a clam bake. I actually attended one. I took pictures. I saw what it's like. So, if we turn it into a national park, that would that would protect the fact that um, that we would not, if 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 it was able to be turned into a national park, we'd be able to um, uh, preserve the future bef- after my time, maybe after your time, that a bridge isn't built because uh, it would take. I, I believe it would take a five, six majority of, of the state legislature to even uh, build a bridge. Um, yeah. so, Councilor Harris, I, I'm just I'm just trying to understand it. I, uh, I absolutely think that we have an opportunity. The city of Quincy has a, an incredible opportunity um, with the fact that Mayor Marty Walsh um, is moving on to a very important role um, as as we have stated earlier and and we will be having um, new partnerships with potentially a new election with a new mayor of the city of Boston. And this has been a battle that we've been having, and I certainly have stood with you alongside of it, and I absolutely understand where you're going with this. But the interconnectivity of ferry, um, I know that the governor passed the state house that we're looking at some potential $2.5 million for a ferry to Boston from Marina Bay for tourism. And spectacle, I mean, um, Long Island has a lot of incredible assets to it as well. Um, Fort Strong is out there, which is um, the original Fort for Civil War that that historically has been there, as we mentioned earlier, the Native American um, historical sites. There's fishing and hiking and recreational things that could happen. And that first step would be working with Boston to make sure that Boston and the new potential mayor to to change it from the Opportunity Zone, but to create it as a... um, as public park system of the national park system. And I think that is definitely- And I mentioned that- uh, uh, I think that's that's something that you were discussing. I mentioned that that that's something that we need to to have happen. Yeah, but that's a partnership that we have to, yeah, we we have to work with the city of Boston to have that happen because Boston, that that puts it in Boston's hand. Boston has to do that for them to be able to have the recovery. And they could have that recovery system, that, that recovery hospital much sooner than a bridge. Um, so I, adep- I absolutely agree with that. I, I was just concerned because the way it was written, it just says willingness to, you know, for us, the city of Quincy, to pay for a ferry. I, I think there's, um, there's. In, I just was curious. So I appreciate. Uh, I appreciate. Left that this- out, uh, counselor, you, you left off the world word help. Yeah. Uh, help. Yep. Help. No, I, 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 thank you. Help. I think counselor you- was your was your que- sorry to interrupt. Counselor, was your question answered? It, 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 and that's what I was just going to say, Councilor Harris. You have you have answered the question, but I just okay. I, I think Thank there's. Thank so I appreciate it. I'm just going to move on if that's all right, Councilor. Yeah, I just want to say it's an opportunity for Quincy to work with the new the, the future new mayor of Boston because I do think mm-hmm. that we both both Quincy and Boston both have the opportunity to be able to help create a solution here. Um, and you know whether it's this resolve of working with the new mayor of Boston, I think I, I'm very hopeful, Council Harris, that we'll be able to find a resolution that will will work well with everybody. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Palmucci. Thank you very much. Um, I, I support, um, and I think we all do. We support a uh, recovery campus on Long Island. That's that's never been the issue. That isn't the issue now. It's never been the issue. Um, each of us knows the great need that there is in in our community, in the Boston community, and frankly across the country, uh, for such programming as has been proposed out there. Um, what we're doing tonight with this resolution is putting our money where our mouth is. We're saying that we'll share the cost of access by ferry, um, that we're not opposed to the recovery center. Uh, we have concerns about the bridge. We have concern, legitimate concerns based on uh, issues. 
um, but we're, we're willing to help fund ferry service so that the recovery campus can get up and running as soon as possible. Uh, as Councilor Harris says, it's already been three years since uh, Mayor Walsh announced uh, this initiative uh, in his State of the City address. Um, a bridge can't be built anywhere near the next couple of days, but you could you could start a ferry service tomorrow out to the bridge and get things going. Um, I support this measure and I support Councillor Harris and the work, the hard work that he's done over the last three years on this issue. Um, I do picture him um, kind of looking like Inspector Gadget over on the island, like taking pictures, you know, in disguise. Um, um, I, and, and quite frankly, you know, this this has always been an, a, a multi a multi tiered concern that the city of Quincy's had. Um, while we support the recovery campus, um, I I certainly I'm not going to speak for my colleagues, but I certainly wouldn't support. And I don't support hundreds of luxury condominiums that are only accessible through one narrow single lane road through the middle of Squam. But I do support a recovery campus and um, willing to put um, Quincy monies towards that because I know that the benefit will be reaped not only by Bostonians, but also by uh, folks from Quincy and from all over the region. And if we can help, uh, if we can help that problem, problem uh, at all, we should do so. And that's what this does. So. I'll certainly be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions or comments by any other councillors? Councillor Harris? Yes, I, I just want to just reiterate something that, that took place, um, and I, I don't have the person's name, and I do know um, the traffic that goes on um, up that road. And uh, we had, uh, unfortunately, we had a uh, um, a pedestrian struck uh, seriously uh, on East Guantanamo Street, right close to where Dorchester, where it meets Dorchester Street, and um, uh, and that's without anything anything going on. So uh, I wanted to make 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 that point, and I want to thank um, Council Palmucci um, for his, for his words and all all of, all all we're trying to say is that uh, here in Quincy, we wanna be part of the solution. There wasn't a discussion with the city of Boston. There was none, right? There was zero. So now um, as the new administration comes in, I, I think this was an olive branch thrown that we would, we would possibly help fund uh what was going on so that was not the intention when it was written because the whole thing with um with the the mayor of boston happened uh after this was written so uh again it's about now we have the opportunity to speak with boston possibly it not being it's my way or the highway anything like that and I'm not saying that that was how it was with the uh, mayor of, of, of Boston, but but we have been in court for three years and we have fought hard and we have held our ground and now it's time to help the people. So that's all I, that's all this was, was about. So I, uh, I, I thank, again, I thank all my colleagues for the last three years since the, the moment that it came up that you supported uh, you supported Ward 6, but not only did you support Ward 6, you supported every single neighborhood that would be affected if ever there was development out there. And of course, I would never see it in my lifetime um, or maybe remember it or know what's happening, but, but you know, for our younger generation, it really, really is important. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Madam, I'm sorry, does anybody else want to speak on this item? Okay, Madam Clerk, could you call the roll, please? Councilor Payne. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. 
Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. President Liang. Yes. Councilor Phelan, are you there? Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Nine members. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, councilors. Thank you, councilor. Madam Clerk, next item on the agenda, please. Number six. 2021-005 or resolve exploring solutions to subpar electricity infrastructures and service. Motion to waive the reading. Motion to waive the reading, Councilor Kane. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so this resolution that I'm put forward tonight um, is really uh, twofold. So uh, over the past six months to a year or so, at least in, in Ward 3 and in other parts of the city, we've been experiencing um, pretty regular blackouts, which um, have been very disappointing. I mean, it's, it's sort of made me feel like we live in a uh, underdeveloped country, uh, which we shouldn't, right? Uh, we, we live in a first world nation. We should have uh, the best infrastructure and access to electricity. Not only is it a disruption for uh, just household operations, but people are now home. It interrupts their uh, work, their livelihood, education, et cetera. Um, and secondly, over the course of the period with which we've been exploring the uh, construction and uh, the build of the municipal fiber network, um, we realized that there's two paths to potentially take for the operation of this network. The first is if the city was willing to uh, operate this network on its own, we would need to develop a municipal power and light plant uh, in order to manage that activity. Secondly, we could uh, if we wanted to outsource the operation, we could do so and move forward as such. But um, the operation as such is that it would probably take about a year to uh, develop and, and put together the municipal power and light uh, com uh, company, which is something that uh, the you know the group that we've been working on this uh, broadband project has been looking into. And so that's that's part of the discussion. So this is an expression of interest that um, would essentially uh, have the administration look into um, one, uh, establishing this power and light company for the purposes of, of not only um, uh, taking over the electricity infrastructure in the city, but also for managing the, uh, the, the broadband capabilities. It would be just like Belled in, in Braintree. Uh, but secondly, I'd love to have an update from National Grid of some sort, a report, uh, have someone from the group come in to the council to explain what's going on. Um, you know, there has been some uh, work done at substations and uh, interconnections in the uh, northern part of the city. And I know that that has probably uh, contributed to some of the blackouts that have taken place. Uh, but just to have a, you know, we'd love to have somebody from National Grid uh, come to the council to uh, provide an update on on what's going on here. We, you know, I've, I've, I've heard from a lot of folks over the last uh, six months to a year about the problems that this is causing. And um, quite frankly, it's it's a little ridiculous. I know that we're an older city, uh, but this is another one of those situations where we are uh, sort of left helpless because we have one service provider providing us electricity. And so we're uh, beholden to them when a problem occurs. So um, a motion to approve. All right, so we have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Seconded by Council McCarthy. Any questions or comments on this item? Okay, the only um, question I have, uh, Councillor, is just that in the resolve, um, if it should pass, it does say that the administration facilitated a, a presentation by National Grid. And so is that something you want to just schedule offline and then we can make sure the date gets out to the public? Or do you have a date in mind if this uh, should pass tonight? I don't I don't have a date in mind. I'm happy to work with uh, the administration to, to facilitate, you know, either the uh, the date of that or, you know, who, you know I don't know how that, that would work. Uh, so, uh, but I don't have a date in mind. Great. Sounds good. Okay, so we have a motion to approve. Um, we also have a second. No other questions or comments? Great. Madam Clerk, could you call the roll, please? Councilor King. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. No. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Eight members, motion passes. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, next we're going to move to the approval of the previous meeting minutes from December 14th. Do we have a motion to approve? Motion to approve by Council McCarthy. Do we have a second? Second. 
Second by Councillor Harris. Okay, any questions or comments on the minutes? No, okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the minutes passed, thank you. Um, next, communications and reports from the mayor, other city officers and city boards. Uh, Councilor DeBone, I believe you had a communication, correct? Yes, thank you, Madam President. I got a Fox Rock Properties LDA update um, dated back on December 17, 2020. Um, hi, Noel, per your request, we're providing the attached LDA progress update for the Ross lot. During the fall, we reached out to all of the city councilors to provide an update and answer any questions they may have regarding the projects. We were able to meet with seven of the nine councils in person to review the information presented in the attached process of update. As noted in the attached update, we have significant progress for Brigham to refine the master plan for the site prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And those efforts have put us in a good position to move forward once Brigham and South Shore, House, South Shore Health can commit principal level attention to future development projects. Thanks for you and your fellow city councilors for all their hard work on the behalf of the city of Quincy. We look forward to providing additional updates in 2021, but don't hesitate to reach out to us for any questions. Um, best regards, Mark Carroll, uh, Managing Director of uh, Fox Rock Properties. Now I have the memorandum in front of me. Um, if anybody needs this, I can I can uh, email it to um, um, Jen um, on our um, clerk of committees um, to be distributed to the rest of the council. Um, uh, to Councilor Noel DeBona, Chairman, Oversight Committee, City of Quincy, um, um, Quincy City Council, from Fox Rock Properties, subject Fox Rock LDA update pursuant to City Council Order uh, 2020-074. Pursuant to the committee's request, Fox Rock Properties offers the following update on the LDA progress at the Ross lot. Refinement of the Ross Parcel Master Plan. After the execution of the uh, Land Disposition Agreement in June of 2019, Fox Rock Properties spent eight months working with Brigham and Women's Hospitals and South Shores Hospitals internal staff and our design consultants at CPT Architects to refine the overall site plan to satisfy the programming requirements of the healthcare partners. During this planning process, it became clear that our healthcare partners needed the parking garage to be located directly adjacent to the medical office building to allow better, better patient access particularly for those with mobility ch challenges. In early 2020, we were working out the final details of a revised master plan with the new parking garage directly adjacent to the medical office building on the north side of the new General's Bridge. Um, new paragraph, uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has, has paused planning efforts. The pandemic required Brigham and Women's Hospital and South Shore Health to refocus their resources to provide medical treatment and address many challenging issues pertaining to the pandemic. So we have not been able to move the design process forward with them. With all of the prior planning and design work our team has completed, we're in good position to proceed once the pandemic subsides and the hospitals can once again uh, focus on planning. Another paragraph, Ross, parcel site work. In early 2020, Fox Rock um, completed demolition of the Commonwealth building to allow for site improvements and infrastructure work to take place at the Ross parcel. Fox Rock is assisting the city with the completion of this work, which is scheduled to be completed by Q2, uh, quarter two, 2021, along with the new park and mass dots completion of the general bridge. bridge. Uh, new paragraph, additional development plans for the Ross parcel. We continue to move forward with the concept design of the other projects, mindful that we need to continue to work with our healthcare partners to finish programming the medical office building before we, are, before we can finalize any plans for other projects. Due to the impact of the pandemic, the hotel industry is experiencing significant financial distress. We, we will continue to evaluate hotel development options with various national hotel flags in 2021. Fox Rock is still committed to build a multifamily workforce housing project with approximately 2,000 units. Since this summer, we have worked with Boston Area Retail Consultant to advance the retail strategy for the Ross Parcel. Um, that was the communications that I have I've met with them back in September um, 17th of this past 2020. Um, they, uh, Mark is, and I've, I've reached out to Mark quite a few times. Um, he has mentioned that if any of the councils have any questions, concerns, their, their door is open. If you don't want to meet in person, but because of the COVID, you can do it even a Zoom meeting, um, but they're willing to ask or answer any questions that you have. Um, I can actually forward this to Jen and Jen can get you the information, but um, that is all the communications that I have for tonight. Thank you. 
Counselor, thank you for the sharing that communication with us. And that would be great if um, you can send them over to Jen so that our colleagues can review them. I know that a couple of our colleagues actually do have some questions now, though, before they review it. Um, if they could just jump in, maybe for some clarification. But we'll start with Counselor Pambucci and then go over to Counselor Mahoney. Counselor Pambucci. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, through you to uh, the chair of the Oversight Committee. Um, Counselor DeBona, we had a, um, or you, you, we, had a oversight committee meeting scheduled, uh, I don't recall the date, um, to speak to Fox Rock and question them about their lack of progress. Um, it was my understanding that they refused to attend, but they're, so essentially they won't come to the council and answer questions about their lack of progress, but they're now sending memos about the progress and inviting us to call them directly outside of a public hearing is that yeah I have all those pieces right yeah I was trying to get them in on 2020 and they they kept on you know saying that um you know like they couldn't make it in I says can you at least give us a kind of an update and they did they agreed to put it in a form of a, um like a note like what I'm reading you in communications this came out to the last prior meeting before our break so I would think it would be beneficial for all of us to, to bring this communications out at our, our meeting. And it's it's our first meeting since the new year. So I, I can't speak with Fox Rock for their um, their position on this. Um, this is all I have to be able to give to the council for right now. Okay, And I'm not blaming you. I, I yeah, mean, I'm not yeah, I'm right. not criticizing you. No, I, I just, you know, sending a memo is is like, uh, you know, putting a note in our locker We're we're the city council of a city that granted them a land disposition agreement of a significant portion of taxpayer owned property. And the fact that they won't appear before this body, I suggest is not only disrespectful to each and every one of us um, who has been working on these issues and working on the downtown in any capacity, but it's disrespectful to the body as a whole and the city as a whole. We are the representatives of the residents of Quincy. And I, and I know I'm not alone when I get questioned I've been questioned repeatedly by residents as to what's going on down there. What's with this medical building? What's with, you know, what's happening? Every time I drive by there, there's nothing happening. I can't answer those questions without talking to Fox Rock. And I've talked to them offline when they said that that's all that they would do. I met with them by Zoom, I think over the summer at some point. Um, but but there's, a, there's a way that government happens and that's having open discussions in a public forum. And if they're afraid to appear in a public forum and answer questions to us, that doesn't give me a lot of confidence that they're capable of, of, uh, of performing under the, the LDA that we, that we uh, signed with them. I mean, it's been less than a year since the pandemic uh, began, right? Just under a year, whether you count of February or, or, or March. They had a, a full year up to that point plus to get this done. So to say that COVID is the reason for the delay I would agree. I would, I would accept that if they had already started the clock by notifying us um, of the um, of the MOB use, which is what triggers the time period in the clock to start ticking on the LDA. We put in a provision at, at my request, and this body supported it. We put in a pr provision of that LDA because we had concerns about them never having ever built anything before. We put in a provision that said, "Well, you can't just sit on the land." In perpetuity, indefinitely here. That after we um, uh, after we give you this we, we give you this land, you have a certain time frame within which to start work. Well, shame on 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 us for not not realizing that um, they controlled the the triggering event of that time frame of that of that clock. So the clock doesn't start ticking until they tell us it starts ticking. So they've waited since June uh, two thousand and nineteen to tell us that they have a tenant. Okay, so for, you know, going on two years now, they have not told us that they have a tenant, even though they've told us from the beginning, I saw a public announcement in the newspaper years ago that it was Brigham was coming to Quincy and South Shore Hospital coming to Quincy, but they haven't officially informed the city that they have a tenant for that medical office building. Therefore, the time the, the time clock doesn't start ticking, and therefore we have we have no leverage against them. Um, as a as a body, we don't. I'm sure the mayor does, um, but we don't. And when we have questions about their progress and why they haven't made any, 
they refuse to come before this board. And I, I've, you know, I've been up here 10 years. I've never seen anything like it other than, you know, the president of National Grid refusing to come um, speak to us and answer our questions about the, uh, the lockout, which I understand a little bit more. I mean, there are a lot more uh, moving parts to deal with that, from legal ramifications to, um, you know, to, to publicity, you know, PR issues that she had. Um, I can understand that she wouldn't appear before us, but this is supposed to be our development partner and they'll only send us letters. Uh, they won't come and have a conversation with us as the people's representative, uh, people's representatives in a public forum. I just think that's, that's shameful. Um, I, I do. And I, and I'll reach out to them, uh, directly myself personally and express that. Uh, but I, I would encourage, uh, you, Mr. Chairman of the oversight committee to, to attempt again, to, to have them appear before us. Cause I, I think it's important. I think you had the right instinct, you and Councillor Mahoney, to have them come before us before. And, um, you know, we can't let their reluctance um, or unwillingness to to be a, a community partner here and a real development partner uh, get in the way of us asking the tough questions. I mean, I would I would even encourage you to, to schedule a meeting and just notify them of it, not even ask them if they're going to come. If they don't come, fine. And we can each take turns. Uh, you know, speaking our mind about how we feel about the, the progress of that project so far, or they can appear and in, in, in answer our questions. But that's um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. I appreciate it. And again, not to take it out on you, no, Councilor Devon, I know it's not you, but, um, you know, it just fires me up a little bit to hearing someone, we asked them to come and answer our questions and they sent us a, uh, you know, a memo. Um, so, you know, Councilor, your, your concerns are my concerns, and that's why I'm, I'm bringing this to the Council to let everybody know that we, we at least at least at the at the minimum council we we got a we got a, like something on paper where I actually can give to you with an update because I've been asking about this update for a couple months but um I, I heard I saw Mr. Walker uh, from the mayor's office he was kind of raising his hand if he would like to elaborate on anything if he he knows any information it'd be great too if through you to the um, through you Madam Chair to the um to Mr. Walker if I could yeah okay. that's appropriate Mr. Madam President thank you you know I I think. Council Palamucci, all due respect, I think we're we're over dramatizing uh, what's happening here. Fox Rock has never refused to come before the council. They've been before the council. They'll be before the council again. I think what they're saying, if you read the memo that they wrote, is that they're at a point in time where they're within negotiations at this point. And they are uncomfortable having a broader public discussion relative to those negotiations at the council level while they're in the middle of these negotiations. That's all it is. There's a lot of things going on in the medical world right now that implicate uh, all of these issues going forward, that implicate the potential partners, that implicate the development. There's obviously a pandemic that stopped development potential dead in its track for a certain amount of time with the biggest medical provider in the state of Massachusetts, who is the development partner on this project, and Fox Rock is simply saying, guys and girls, look, here's where we're at. The pandemic put a little bit, put the brakes on some certain areas of this. We're still moving forward. When we're ready to come back and have more of a, a fruitful discussion and answer those questions, we can do that. But now's not the time. We're right in the middle of this thing. And I think that's a, that's a fair way to look. At it. They're not saying they're not gonna be before the body. They're not saying they're not coming back. They're not ignoring the body. And they're just saying they're in the middle of a negotiation right now. We need some breathing room. The partners need some breathing room. Everyone needs a little bit of breathing room to figure out where the world is going to be within the next few months to figure out where this project is going. Um, and going forward, there's been nothing but express confidence that ultimately we're going to get there on this. But now it's just not the time for a full throat and public discussion with the private development partner on this based upon their interpretation of where they are in the negotiation process with the tenant. I think there's nothing unfair about, about that. And I don't, there's nothing untoward, there's nothing shameful, there's nothing that they're trying to hide here. They're just in the middle of a negotiation. Let's, let's cut them a little bit of slack. Mr. Walker, with all due respect right back at you, we've cut them slack for two years. For two years, they they jerked around for the first eighteen months. They didn't the do LDA, anything. How many plants? No, no, hold LDA, on. Let me finish. The LDA was um, signed. Let me finish. Okay, okay, sure. that's where I stopped. I, I apologize, four. but when people are let talking over folks, that's you don't where raise I your voice so, at me. I'm a member of this board. Counselor, you're counselor, a guest yes. in counselor, the chamber. Counselor, 
so to the both of you, when, when folks are starting to talk over one another and interrupt, that's where I stop. Okay, so uh, Mr. Walker, I appreciate your commentary to, you know, the communication that was brought in. We are right now discussing a communication that was brought in by a chairperson. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you bringing in the communication. Counselor, you know, you had your reaction to a communication that was brought in, and that's where we are right now. So I'd like to well, move I have a point on of personal from that. Privilege. Mr. Mr. Walker, invoke my name, and I want to respond to that. No, That's, and you can. I'm that, just saying that I would respectfully ask, though, that all of us not speak over one another because then we miss out on hearing things that, truthfully, I would like to hear what everyone has to say. And I think that's his basic decorum as well, that we respect one another enough to not speak over one another. So, you know, Mr. Walker, if you have your thought that you'd like to finish, Counselor, I would like Mr. Walker to finish his thought. And then since the right, since he invoked your name, if you'd like to respond, then I invite you to respond. Can we both agree to that? You yeah, he's done, right? Mr. Walker, are you, have you finished your thought? I apologize to the counselor if I talked over him on that. I would just like to remark that it has not been more than two years. The LDA was June of twenty of 2019. We're less, considerably less than two years. And when the pandemic is factored into it, that's another 10 or 11 months there. So I, I think we're we're putting a, a level of pressure on the private developer here and extending things that aren't necessarily the, the way that, that, that they're being um, suggested here. It hasn't been two years. Um, Mr. Walker, thank you. Counselor, yeah. Counselor yeah. Devon, I'm gonna allow Counselor Pumwichi to speak and then uh, I'm gonna okay. move on to Counselor Mahoney who's been waiting patiently and then I'll come back to you, Counselor Devon. Yeah. Counselor Pumwichi? It was said that it was two years since the LDA was signed. It was. 18 months between when the LDA was signed and when the pandemic struck. So my comment to you, sir, was that they jerked around for 18 months. They changed their plans a half dozen times. Uh, they uh, terminated the president or whoever the, the project manager was. We've seen a change of leadership there. Uh, and quite frankly, I, I don't have a lot of confidence that, that they're going to perform as they say they do. I know that you have confidence and the mayor has confidence, that's fine. Perhaps that's because you have uh, more frequent uh, communications with them. But what I find shameful is that when the body through the chair of the oversight committee and the ordinance committee asks them to come in and answer some questions from counselors, that they don't. That's what I find shameful and that they send a memo instead. That to me is shameful because we're all adults and we understand if there's a question they can't answer because they're in contractual negotiations with somebody. We understand that. We get that. One of the questions I want to ask them, uh, or many of the questions I want to ask them is what they did in that first 18 months. So separate and apart from COVID-19, what did they do? What steps did they take to, to accomplish this, this, uh, uh, this development program? So for them to say to us that now is not the time, I don't think that's up to them. If the council has questions, based on the community having questions, then the time to answer questions is when the questions arise. Again, we're we're all grownups here. We're, we're not gonna put them at any type of uh, um, legal jeopardy if they need to say, you know what, we just can't speak to that one particular issue right now because we're in negotiations. Or we can't give you a firm timeline on when we're gonna have a deal signed because we're in negotiations. That's fine. But there are a lot of other questions that we can ask uh, Fox Rock in terms of their development in the downtown area. And I think for them to refuse to appear as they, as reported by Councilor DeMona, that they, they wouldn't come to an oversight committee meeting uh, that was scheduled, I think is shameful. They're our development partner and they'll only talk to us in private. I, that to me uh, doesn't sit well. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor, we'll go to Councilor Mahoney and then back to Councilor DeMona. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, I too find it very frustrating and I didn't vote for the LDA and they did have time and to use the pandemic as, um, as a, a stopping point for discussions or to think that you can invite each one of us individually to come join them on Zoom, but they can't join us on Zoom is highly insulting. And the thing is, is that their professional group that we, that the city of Quincy feels that they are worthy of being hired to do something in the city of Quincy. Whether they're in negotiations or not with their potential tenant does not prevent them from being able to come before us and to discuss the issues with us. 
But to send a memo, it is rather insulting. And again, this is not Noel de Bono's ish fault. But I would also think the administration would be insulted because this is your partner and it reflects on you. Now, the other thing is, is Quincy has been famous for this. Historically, we take longer than anybody else to get anything off the ground. Other other areas, we like to quote the other areas when it comes to taxes, we have the lowest taxes than anybody else. Well, other, other communities have started their development and have actually seen development happen. This is a situation where we had a press conference with Fox Rock before the LDA was done telling, boasting about how we had the agreement in hand and we were ready to move. Now we start the clock then, Mr. Walker, the LDA might have been passed just last year, but the fact of the matter is, is we have played everything out in the press with Fox Rock and they will not come before us, the city council to answer questions. And we're being told it's because they're in negotiations. But you can, councillors, you can all have a private Zoom meeting with them when the public wants to know what's happening with the public project that's supposed to be happening. The LDA was done through the council providing them the land to develop on. Furthermore, they also had, with this incredible opportunity that they were provided from the city, they also got Hospital Hill with a 4.5 reverter that was supposed to come to the city. Have we received any deposits or any money from Fox Rock in regards to the LDA that we did? Or does that not start until the memorandum of understanding starts too? Could I ask Ms. Ms. Um, um, could I ask Ms. O'Connor about that? Or do you know, Mr. Walker? Uh, we have not yet received payment for the reverter. That's a trigger mechanism that is uh, up on the hill. So that's also part of the mechanism that's up on the hill. So so here we were that we had to rush to the planning board and make sure we got that passed and they got whatever they wanted to take over. And then they also have other properties in the city of Quincy, the Masonic Temple that we had a different presentation in the Patriot Ledger several years ago. And now we have a new presentation. And now we're not just doing that, but we're also doing it. It seems like there's an awful lot of smoke and mirrors going on in the city of Quincy with press releases that, that don't produce much of anything. Yet they are who we have to work with and they won't come before the city council to discuss any of it with us. But yet we can read about everything in the newspaper but we can't ask them one question and we can also read their, mem their, their memos they send us. So I do find it highly insulting. I do find it very questionable. And there was another article and I don't have my fingers on it right now, but it was over the summer in which that they were suggesting that they might have to work out or maybe even be um, giving forgiveness because of the pandemic for, and I'll find the article, Mr. Walker, um, that they might need to be given forgiveness because of the pandemic. I don't know any other development in the, in, in any area that would be in the situation that they're in now that they are not ready to move forward with that. You see Boston, there is development happening all over the place. We kept things going during the pandemic so development could happen in the city of Quincy. The only ones who are not doing anything is Fox Rock. And I would think the administration would be, be furious because it's your reputation. I'm very concerned about this and the memo just doesn't cut it. And that's Thank not you. theatrics, that's the reality of where we stand. Thank you, you Councillor. I'm going to, you know what, to be very honest with everybody, I'm, I'm going to do a point of order right now. This is a communication that was brought in by a chairperson. I appreciate folks, sh you know, sharing their reactions to this, but from um, my perspective, I feel this is a much larger conversation um, that should be brought in formally so that the public also knows that we're going to be discussing an item that isn't generally, you know, on the agenda for tonight. So folks don't know that we're having this conversation. And I want to respect um, everyone who spoke tonight on this particular topic. I want to respect all of your perspectives and your passions on this and think that and we can address it most importantly when it's on the agenda. So I'm going to move on. Uh, Councilor Madam Devona, President, back to you to wrap it up and then we can move on. Madam President, before we move on, may I just say that I think we should have uh, a lawyer, uh, uh, Mr. Shea, involved because I, I believe that some of the things that might have been said tonight could put this, this council at risk for, for lawsuit. Okay, we can discuss that um, offline, but I appreciate the input. Again, Councilor Devona, back to you to wrap this up and let's move on. Um, just on a verbal agreement, it's very similar to Mr. Walker. They're in a negotiation process and they, they basically, uh, I, I had asked for them to come in and, and they couldn't come in in time. And I said, can I at least get some type of communication? And they actually you know, emailed this to me. I thought I'd bring it to the council because Council Mahoney and Council Pumich have been asking about this. They put it as a form of a resolution back in April. So. I thought it to the body um, that we bring it and give you this type of information. It's it's something. I, I know it's not uh, in front of us or on Zoom, but uh, if I get any more communications or any more um, 
insight from Fox Rock, I will I will deliver it to the body. Thank you. No, thank you for your transparency, Council. I appreciate it. And like I said, I think that there's a number of folks who um, are very passionate about this. And so I know that this is not the end of the topic and we certainly can coordinate and should coordinate a formal conversation moving forward. Okay, uh, any other communications and reports from the mayor, other city officers or city boards? Councillor Kroll. Thank you, uh, excuse me. Madam President, uh, tough transition, um, the wrong communication. I've, uh, uh, I've gotten a lot of communication tonight that people just, uh, the beard is not doing it. Um, so I guess I gotta reevaluate that. But uh, part of uh, part of the reevaluation process uh, would be with respect to um, my, uh, my capacity as a city councilor. Um, many folks, some know, some don't. Um, I know I had conversations with uh, all the councils prior to. But, uh, you know, my family dynamic is changing um, with uh, the birth of our third child, um, which obviously, as we all know, this, um, this job is uh, it's not a nine to five. It's more like a 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. And, uh, you know, through careful thought and consideration and careful thought and consideration with uh, my wife. Come to the conclusion that um, I will be stepping down effective uh, January 19th. Um, tough decision, but I, I believe it's the right one. Uh, allow me to have more family time and you know, focus my energy on some other opportunities. Uh, but I just want to be clear. Um, I, I'll have my epilogue written for, uh, for next uh, next council meeting. But, um, you know, as, as I've shared with you, I'm 110% all in uh, and available to, uh, to help with the transition. Um, so I just wanted to make that part of the public record. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I hope you didn't just do that because of what just happened. <laughs> Um, no, but kidding aside, I know you had wanted to speak um, <laughs> when Councillor Devona had raised his hand. Um, I appreciate you sharing that news with us. Obviously, I think that all of us need to digest it and, and take some space to um, find our again, reaction to what you're sharing with us. And when you uh, say a formal goodbye with us next week, I would like to it's invite nice my colleagues. To say about, give you a week, yeah, right? <laughs> I would like to uh, invite my colleagues next week again when you Get say it. your formal goodbye to uh, to share their thoughts because I want to give them time to digest and process this as well. So thank you for sharing that. And again, uh, we look forward to sharing a formal goodbye with you um, next week. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. Any other communications and reports from the mayor, other city officers or boards? Okay, seeing none, unfinished business and proceeding meeting. Okay, seeing none, reports of committees. All right, gonna keep moving. Presentation of petitions, memorials and remonstrance. Council Kroll. Thank you, um, Madam President. It's with a heavy heart, and um, I know, you know, several members uh, on this call here that are at this meeting here uh, have a relationship with um, Mary Jane. She goes by Jane Mudge, and you know, one of the distinct, and I do mean this, like distinct privileges that I have as a as a ward councilor is to represent uh, 1,000 Southern Ottery that is, you know filled with uh, just joy, honestly. And, um, you know, I frequent the building as, um, you know, others would. And, and um, you know, you get to really know uh, people and sort of their story. And, you know, Jane was definitely, uh, she was a, a socialite and took an active interest, not just in, you know, city issues or things that were going on, but like generally in people. And we would talk, uh, from a pretty technical standpoint um, on things like the compressor station. And Jane's formal training, she was actually a nurse at uh, Quincy Hospital and spent uh, a lot of her life uh, helping people. And, you know, again, just one of those beaming personalities that um, you just really enjoyed seeing when, uh, when you when you went to 1000 Southern Ottery, uh, I after reading the obituary, it was kind of interesting that the way that they had uh, summarized it, that she would like to put on uh, jazzy dresses and a pair of high heels and go dancing at the uh, the fight club. 
and um, you know, again, big loss to uh, a thousand Southern Artery. Certainly, keep our prayers um, and our thoughts with uh, the Mud family during, uh, during this time of challenge. Um, Thank, Thank you, you so much, Councillor. She's definitely leaving a huge hole in the community. Um, any other petitions? I'm sorry, presentations of petitions, memorials, and remonstrance. Okay, seeing none, scheduling of committee meetings and public hearings. Okay, seeing none, our next meet, oh, Councillor Mahoney. Sorry about that. Um, yes, I'd like to schedule um, a six o'clock public hearing for the Department of um, Justice and um, Equity, and, um, and then follow that up with some discussion on January 19th at six o'clock. Um, so we're going to be discussing 2020-165, which was the Department of Social Justice. And then I'd also like to add to the agenda 2020-131, which is the ordinance amending, amending um, licenses and permits for um, towing regulations. And then also 2020-132, which is um, also an amending of Chapter 196 for fingerprints and criminal record case checks. And those will be all on um, January 19th, starting at 6 o'clock. Great. Thank you, Councillor. And then our regularly scheduled uh, council meeting will start after that at 7.30. Any other scheduling of committee meetings and public hearings? Okay, seeing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thank you all. Please be safe and have a good night. Good night, good night Mr. Walker. Good night.